I'd like to call, it, to call to order this meeting of the Pennsylvania House Labor and Industry Committee. If we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The flag was small but mighty. I'm Stephen Bloom. I am I've been a member of the House Labor and Industry Committee, Secretary of the Committee, and I've been deputized by Chairman Scavello to run the meeting here this afternoon. I want to start out by allowing the, the members that are here to introduce themselves. And uh, I wanted to make note of the presence also of Representative Garth Everett, who is from this local area and who is gracious with his presence here at the hearing as well. And uh, we'll start at my far right and have the members of the committee. Oh, Representative. I'm sorry, I did not see Representative Mirabuta back there. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll start with the far right, uh, my far right, and we'll have the members introduce themselves. Greg Lucas, 5th District, Erie and Crawford County. Afternoon, Brian Cutler, 100th District, Southern Lancaster County. Linda Schlegel Culver, 108th District, uh, parts of Northumberland and Snyder Counties. I'm Dan Truitt from the 156th District in Chester County. Uh, Representative Fred Keller, 85th District, Snyder and Union Counties. Representative Pam Snyder, the 50th District, Green, portions of Fayette and Washington Counties. I'm John Galloway. I'm a state representative in the 140th District, which is Lower Bucks County. Thank you. We have been holding a series of hearings on the issue of prevailing wage reform across the state uh, in the Capitol, and today is another in that series. We're trying to hear from uh, local individuals, municipal officials, people in business and people in labor who are interested in the issue. We've heard a lot of great testimony so far uh, over the previous several months. There are a number of different bills pending, uh, different, different possible scenarios for reform of, of the prevailing wage laws as they now stand. And today we're looking forward to another day of, of getting some excellent testimony on the record so we can get a better feel for what the, the appropriate solutions to some of the challenges and difficulties posed by the existing prevailing wage law we can address. I wanted to, in lieu of the, uh, the presence of our Democratic chair, I wanted to give Representative Galloway uh, the opportunity just to make a brief introductory statement as well. Thank you, Representative Bloom. I appreciate that. Um, first, I want to say, I haven't been to Williamsport since I was a kid. My dad took me here when I was uh, a young boy, and um, I've been around here uh, for a while, but I haven't really stopped into this town. And I came in last night, and first thing I did was I drove by the Little League fields, and I parked my car, and I walked down that, that hill. And um, this is an absolutely gorgeous part of the world. Uh, you know, there's places in Pennsylvania where you know, when you stop in, your jaw just drops, and, and this is one of them. It's a great town, it's good people, friendly people, and um, it's nice to be here. I'm a, um, what they would call a, a conservative Democrat. I have a reputation for um, being, you know, what we used to call a Bob Casey Democrat. I'm not a, you know, a knee-jerk liberal Democrat. I'm not someone who um, takes cheap shots. Hopefully I have a reputation of, of finding common ground and getting things accomplished and keeping my word. And a good example of that is um, last year when I worked with a Republican governor and a Republican House and a Republican Senate to pass um, comprehensive illegal immigration reform. I found compassionate common ground um, and passed something called E-Verify, which uh, is now the law of the land for all public projects in Pennsylvania. We have a, um, and I'd also like to say that the people on this panel, the, the Republicans on this panel are, are good people. I, mean, I have a lot of respect for each and every one of them. Extremely smart, extremely bright. I'm not gonna sit here today and, and take cheap shots. I, I'm gonna stick to the facts. Someone who's been part of this um, discussion for three years now. I've attended hearing after hearing after hearing. 
And hopefully, this is the last one. From what I've heard, this is the last one. Um, Pennsylvania's in a lot of trouble right now. We're 49th out of 50th in job creation. It's hard to believe when we're sitting on the Marcellus or the Saudi Arabia of Marcellus show. Our economy is contracting, unlike New York and New Jersey and Ohio. Let's make no mistake about it. What you're about to discuss, what you're about to, to talk about, this legislation isn't going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere because of me. It's not going anywhere because of Democrats. Democrats, we don't control anything in Harrisburg. We have a Republican governor. We have a Republican House by historic margins. We have the only Republican-controlled Senate in the entire Northeast. If the Republicans wanted to pass this legislation, they could do it today. They could do it yesterday. They could have done it years ago. But they won't. Not because of Democrats. The Senate Republicans are on record as saying they're not going to look at this issue. We have a serious problem in Harrisburg. Nothing is getting done. And it's not because Democrats are fighting Republicans. I'm not going to sit here and say Democrats are any better than Republicans. <laughs> in a lot of ways, maybe we would be doing the same thing if we were in total control. But why nothing is happening is because Republicans are fighting with Republicans. Republicans in the House are fighting with Republicans in the Senate. Republicans in the Senate are fighting with Republicans in the House. Republicans in the House are fighting with each other. And the governor's fighting with all of them. And nothing is getting done. We go in Harrisburg, we go into session, we break for six hours so Republicans can sit in a caucus and fight over what they're going to bring onto the floor. We go onto the floor. Representative Galloway, could, could we uh, please, uh, we, I wasn't looking for an extended opening statement. If you would mind kind of wrapping things up so we can get into the testimony of the witnesses that have taken their time to be my, here this my point is, is My point is this, and I, I will make it brief, and I appreciate that. Like I said, I'm not someone who takes cheap shots. But I've been through years and years and years of talking about this bill. And at every single hearing, we're able to prove that people who show that this is going to save taxpayer dollars are wrong. They're wrong because the data that they use to extrapolate that conclusion is wrong. Non-union contractors don't submit wage data. Therefore, your data is wrong. Therefore, your conclusions are wrong. Labor costs barely reach 18% of a project, yet you talk about saving 20%. How are you going to do that? What are you going to do? Move it down to 17%, 16%? That's all you're going to do is suppress wages a little bit so contractors can save a little bit of money. We've shown it over and over again. Just yesterday, when a bill was passed, a prevailing wage bill was passed out of committee, we offered an amendment to force everyone to submit data. That would make the data correct. Republicans voted no. We offered an amendment to provide receipts if you submit the data. They voted no. We offered an amendment to make sure that the projects weren't divided so people couldn't cheat. Republicans voted no. We offered an amendment to prevent kickbacks, and Republicans voted no. I'm willing to work with anyone who can make things better. But after three years, this show is ending. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Galloway. Um, And, and just just by way of the record, we did agree as as uh, the Republican chairman and the Democratic chairman agreed yesterday to discuss those amendments and uh, consider them on the floor. But I want to go ahead and jump right into our witnesses because they have taken time to be here and we're already a minute or two behind schedule. And it's going to be important to try to stick with the schedule throughout the afternoon as a courtesy to all those who have taken time to be here. So I would like uh, County Commissioners Jeff Wheland and Joseph Krantz, if you gentlemen could please step up to the table. 
And uh, to the extent, and this goes for any of the witnesses today, to the extent you were, you were able to summarize your testimony without reading the entire written testimony that you may have brought along, uh, certainly that would be benefited, uh, appreciated by members of the committee, and I think would actually help us get to the nugget of some of the issues. So uh, feel free to deviate from your written remarks and kind of shorten and summarize so that we can uh, keep on track. If you gentlemen want to proceed, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify uh, before this committee. Um, again, my name is Jeff Wheeland. I'm chairman of the uh, Lycoming County Board of Commissioners. Um, I have, uh, as, and I will be brief, um, you have a copy of my written testimony. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip right ahead, if I could, to, to specific examples. Uh, with respect to Representative Galloway. Here's, here's an example, if you turn to page two, where you can extrapolate accurately prevailing wage. And this was a project that's currently ongoing, which is a demolition of a, uh, an old factory, the Brodart Building. It's a Brodart project here in Lycoming County. And it's a, a premier brownfield re revitalization site Federal and state dollars were part of the funding mix for that demolition work. And as such, uh, federal Davis-Bacon rates governed the labor costs. Contractors on the project, uh, and, and again, it's easy to figure out because they're paying the Davis-Bacon rates uh, versus prevailing wage. And had the Davis-Bacon rates not superseded prevailing wage rates uh, or being trumped by the Davis-Bacon rates, the project costs would have been about 30% higher because it's a very labor-intensive project. Uh, following are two comparisons to help explain this potential increase. The Davis-Bacon rate for a carpenter is roughly $19 an hour, whereas the prevailing wage rate is about $40 an hour. The Davis-Bacon rate for an unskilled laborer is about $15 an hour, and the prevailing wage rate is about $35. Now, to be fair, these kinds of cost uh, disparities are not consistent across all labor categories, but they do illustrate, uh, certainly to me, that uh, these inflated wage rates erode the effectiveness of our public project funding. The prevailing rates would have been invoked this demolition budget could have cost the city an additional two hundred eighty to three hundred thousand dollars, and believe me, we spent almost years, well, literally years, uh, gathering up the dollars for this project, much needed project for brownfield re revitalization. And I was always under the assumption that state government was smarter than federal government, uh, but in this particular case, uh, the federal government tends to be a little smarter when it comes to. Uh, taxpayer dollars. Um, I have another example. We uh, currently are in the process of uh, building a $3.6 million terminal for the Williamsport Regional Airport, and it's uh, going to be constructed within the next three years. And once again, thank goodness, uh, the Davis Bacon rates are applied, so uh, we're going to save about $350,000 on that project versus the uh, prevailing wage. Um, another example is our Lycoming County Transportation Improvement Program, or the TIP. We uh, have about $15 million in highway and bridge projects that are funded by uh, $100,000 by state dollars, all subject to the prevailing rate, uh, rate provision. If these projects could have been funded with federal dollars instead of state dollars, thus invoking federal uh, Dave and Bacon, uh, Davis-Bacon rates, it's estimated that approximately four and a half million dollar in project delivery costs could be saved. You know, these costs could be conceivably cover the expense of upgrading over seven locally structurally deficient bridges. I have other examples uh, that you can read in my testimony, but I do believe that, that to get an accurate number on the savings, you can use Davis-Bacon on a job versus prevailing wage. And I also, if you look at the very last page, I provided uh, compliments of the Burroughs Association, an analysis uh, on the different wage categories, uh, prevailing wage rates. Here's another example. Here in Lycoming County, 
we had uh, we do a lot of work with Habitat for Humanity, and we allocated twenty five thousand dollars from our two thousand and five fund, state funded brownfields for housing program, together with some Act one thirty seven affordable housing dollars to help the local affiliate construct an affordable home. Both funding sources were determined by Department of Labor and Industry to be subject to prevailing wage. The net effect of our investment was that the prevailing wage rates drove a cost increase to the project up about $15,000. In short, nearly 60% of county's contribution was lost to the prevailing wage induced labor cost. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the, the real crux of the matter here is, is me as county commissioner, we have a great working relationship with our 52 municipalities. It wasn't, it was only about two years ago that we put out a, a, a letter to municipalities, 52 municipalities, uh, our uh, authorities, basically requesting what are your infrastructure needs? And here in Lycoming County, population 120,000 people, we have over a billion, a billion dollars worth of infrastructure needs. We have a log jam of projects that cannot be done because of the prevailing wage. This stuff gets put on the shelf, so to speak. Only the projects that absolutely positively have to be done, we have to gather up the money to do those projects and other projects suffer. Just recently, yesterday, it was in the newspaper locally here, we have a, a ballpark up here that needed painted. They figured they had budgeted the city, budgeted $45,000. They had forgotten that it would, the prevailing wage would have kicked in. The bids came in at 89000 Project shelved. Infrastructure is crumbling underneath us, and we're not doing enough about it. This would be a small part to help get these projects moving and moving forward. One of the considerations I'd like to present to you, and it's not in my testimony, it was only thought of last night, was give the counties an option for a five-year moratorium on prevailing wage. Give us the option. Set it aside for five years. Let's get rid of this log jam of projects that have to be done. It's a thought, um, you know, it, and it, obviously it would help stimulate the economy. So uh, if there's any questions, I'll feel free to take them. Do Commissioner is uh, we'll allow your colleague to go ahead and offer his testimony, and then we'll have questions for both of you if you don't okay. mind doing it that way. Thank Commissioner, you. thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Kantz. I'm from Snyder County. I'm the chairman of commissioners there. I'm also the treasurer for the State uh, County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania, and I thank you for allowing us to be here to offer our testimony today. I I'm going to go over my testimony very quickly, but I do have brief statements here that I'll uh, look at. And again, I, I want the, the people that are here behind me to realize as well. Imagine the years 1962, the cost of ga a gasoline, a gallon of gasoline, 31 cents. I wasn't even born yet. I don't remember those days, but I wish I could recognize them today. But uh, 31 cents, and look what we're paying today. Three, 337 was the cheapest gas on the way here from Sealands Grove today. Um, you know, the average labor uh, back, the average home cost in 1962, $18,200. I don't even know if I could buy roofing for that much today, but uh, you know things have changed a lot. But one thing that has not changed over the last 50 years is the $25,000 threshold for prevailing wage. I, you know, I think it would be ludicrous for anyone in this building to say that we should be paying laborers the same rate they made in 1962, yet that's exactly what we're telling the taxpayers, that their money is not worth as much, and they have to pay that same amount that they paid back in 1962, they've got to pay that prevailing wage on the same amount that was set back in, in 1962, which is ludicrous as well. Now, Pennsylvania Building and Construction Trades Council, I believe they're going to testify here today. On their website, 
when a white paper um, makes an argument against Prevailing Wage Act uh, that says it drives up the cost of construction. They, they oppose the people that, that say that. Uh, opponents of Prevailing Wage have claimed elimination of this onerous act would save 10 to 30 percent. I want to give you some examples to show you that that is exactly true in my county, where I come from. We are not a heavily unionized county. I'll be very honest about that. I think anybody that lives there would agree. And to date, all of the projects that I have bid out as a commissioner, not one single union shop has bid on those jobs. So I, I'm trying to lay out all the facts so we can, and that may not be the case in all the counties. I realize that. But in Snyder County, our commissioners have really worked hard to try and take on some building maintenance projects that technically have been left go for many years. We're trying to get the buildings up to snuff because I think it's, it's cheaper in the long run to take care of things as they present themselves and to wait till there's a major disaster and then try and fix everything. And hopefully we'll save money. But let me give you a few examples. In, in 2010, we replaced all of the windows in our courthouse. They were terrible. They were outdated. They were falling apart. We spent $133,000. This was a very um, materials-based bid. Most of the money went into the, the materials, the new windows. The labor was not that intensive. It was more materials cost in that bid, to be fair. Um, our market-based wage, if we'd have paid a market-based wage, we would have saved about $14,000 in labor costs on that project. Um, so that's only 10.5%, but that does fall between 10 and 30%. In 2011, we did masonry project, a lot more labor intensive. Materials were very minimal. You know, some new mortar, taking off the caps on the building, putting them back on, but mainly that project was labor. So we, we would have saved a lot more money. That price tag on that project was only $55,000, but if we would have not had to fall within that prevailing wage rate, we technically wasted $15,000 on that project because of prevailing wage, which is 27%, again, between 10 and 30%. 2012, we replaced a flat roof on the courthouse at a price tag of $132,000. Again, very labor intensive. Um, there were some materials involved, obviously, but a lot of labor to install that new roof. $30,000 wasted. Now, some people may say, well, I don't think it's fair to use the term wasted. So I thought, okay, I'll be fair. I'll look it up in the dictionary. And the definition is used or expended carelessly or to no purpose. Well, again, in my county, if we'd used a true Snyder County market-based wage rate, we would have done the same work, paid workers a, a fair wage that they would normally make in our county, and to boot, my taxpayers would have saved $59,000. That would have been enough for us to do yet another project in those three years that we couldn't afford. Now, if prevailing wage was so necessary in Pennsylvania and the $25,000 threshold was a fair rate in 62, then uh, no one can argue against the threshold being increased to 190000 today because that's the rate of inflation. Fair is fair. The workers have been uh, protected for the past 51 years, and I think it's about time the taxpayers would be treated the same since they are paying the rate. Um, Again, you know, you, you've seen the, the projects, you've heard all the testimony. The old adage, time is money, holds true for our county commissioner's office, and I'm sure construction companies could do without all the additional paperwork that Representative Galloway mentioned earlier. I understand some members of this committee had questions about that in the past, uh, some of the hearings. And um, quite frankly, I'm sure if I was a private con contractor and I wasn't working a prevailing wage job, I don't have time to submit that information. I have time to do my job, try and make a fair weight, a fair uh, profit for my family and provide for them and my community. So I can understand why they may not want to turn that information in. Um, let me offer up a couple ideas that maybe would help take some political heat off of you all. Um, I understand this was brought up yesterday, and, and I applaud you for taking up the issue of an opt-out policy. That is the most common sense approach to this I've heard yet, because in my county, and I had this discussion with, with Representative Snyder when she was a county commissioner, and I understand the issue of being in a heavily unionized county. I've talked to some of my fellow commissioners yesterday when I called about 35 commissioners around the state to tell them about the bill that you all were discussing yesterday. I understand that we, we are different. We are all Pennsylvanians, but we are different from county to county to county. We have different things that make up our local economies. All I'm asking for is giving us the option in each of our own respective counties to take the political heat. If we live in an area that does not have a heavily, heavily unionized workforce, then let us make that choice. We're the ones that are going to come under fire as county, county commissioners and municipal leaders and school boards 
So I, I appreciate the fact that that was brought up. And if that doesn't come to fruition, then at least please raise that threshold to 190000 And by all means, it's so important that we don't have, this, have to have this discussion, discussion again in 50 years. Please tie it to some kind of escalator so that we don't have to be back here and go through the many hearings that you all have suffered through. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I did want to share one closing remark. There was a gentleman that was on our window replacement project. His name was Joe, so we kind of hit it off, and he was a good guy. And I, I'd see him every morning on the way in my, into the courthouse and talk to him. And, and I said, Joe, you know, you normally make $15 an hour. You're, on this project, you're making 30 was the labor rate for that particular project. I said, are you working any harder? And he, you know, he kind of, with a wink and a smile, he said, no, but it might take me a little bit longer on this one. We shouldn't have to be in that situation as taxpayers. I'm here representing my taxpayers today. So, again, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much to both commissioners. Question, please. Commissioner Wheeland, uh, on the projects you were discussing where you had a, a differential between Davis-Bacon rates and Pennsylvania prevailing wage rates, was there any difference in the quality of work between those two rates that, that, that the, would the construction have been any different, whether it was paid at Davis-Bacon rates or prevailing wage rates, or was it just more expensive for the taxpayers under prevailing wage? Well, I believe the, the first example using Davis-Bacon and prevailing wage is an ongoing project right now. So, and again, it's, it's uh, demolition. So... You know. So either way, the building's going to be gone at the end of the day. That's correct. Just more expensive under prevailing wage. And I believe the other one um, is the regional airport that's uh, yet to be constructed. Um, but I will tell you, uh, as, an ex as a further example, is I, I, we had a pre-bid conference for our landfill, and one of, two of our fields were closing, and we have to put a dirt, it's like a yarmulke on top of it, and then a you know, dirt on top of it, 24 inches of dirt, uh, to close those two fields. Pre-bid conference, uh, our engineers guessing that because it does invoke prevailing wage, uh, it'll be about a $200,000 additional expense. Now, you know, putting a piece of plastic down, I think we could take everyone at that front table with a little bit of practice we could put a plastic sheet down them and run 24 inches of dirt over top of it. Um, and it's going to cost the citizens of, of Lycoming County $200,000. You know, we could certainly use that $200,000 to go repair one of our over 100 structurally deficient bridges here in Lycoming County. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Cantz, uh, as far as the, the project you talked about, is there any difference in the quality of work that would be provided under prevailing wage versus the competitive bid, or is it just a much higher price to the taxpayers for the same exact work? It, it is obviously a much higher price to the taxpayers. I, I can tell you, I'll give an example right now. We're, we're doing a painting project on our courthouse. It hasn't been painted for about 20 years. All of the trim around the third story. It's tough work. You know, I, I particularly wouldn't want to be up there on some of those lifts and ladders. But uh, they're doing an excellent job. And every day I go out front to look at the, and it just looks incredible because it's just like a, a night and day change when they, when they finally scrape all that paint off and then apply the new paint. These guys are on a prevailing wage project. It's a $79,000 project, which was not in my testimony. It's evolving here as we, as we actually speak. And, uh, you know, it's a very, as you can imagine, painting is very labor intensive. The paint is minimal cost. But... The total project $79,000, and I haven't seen all the figures yet because they're not in, but my guess is that, you know, we're going to be in the $20,000 range of overage for prevailing wage rates if they were based upon the fact if they were doing a regular job without prevailing wage, it would have been about $20,000 less is my guess. Based upon the numbers I've extrapolated right. from other projects, I'm, I'm thinking that's about where it's going to be. These guys are all local workers. They're, they take pride in their work. Uh, in this particular job, half of them are, are pastors part-time and take a lot of pride in what they're doing. And, and I mean, you can see the, the, the pride beaming from their faces when they're up there, and I'll yell up to them, you know, and the, the quality of work is there regardless. You know, in Snyder County, I don't know how it is in your counties, but in my county, we all take pride in what we do. You know, we, we expect a fair wage for a fair work. 
And uh, most of the people in my county, they give more than 110% when they're out on their job. And, and I know Representatives Culver and, and Keller know those folks just as I do, and they can speak to that. But it's just an, it's an overreaching um, requirement today to force taxpayers to pay more than what they would need to pay. You mentioned the painting project, which mm -hmm. you said is obviously very labor intensive. And you talked about some other projects. Do you have a sense for what what the typical range might be for some of these projects, what percentage of the project is actual labor costs that are directly affected by prevailing wage. And again, that's why I pulled out some of the percentages in my testimony. Every project's different, you know. Like I said, in the masonry project, very few materials. You're talking, you know, new, new grout for between the bricks. You're taking off the old capstones. You're putting them back on. You know, we had a stainless cap that goes underneath it. There's not a lot of materials in that $55,000 total price tag. Most of that work is labor. The window project, completely different. You know, now you're talking twelve to $1,500 per window at state contract prices. You know, your labor to put them in is not nearly $1,200 per window because it's, it's a, you rip the old one out, you put the new one in. It's pretty simple. Um, so not nearly as much labor intensive. So the, the percentage of savings was much, much less on that job, 10.7%, as opposed to the 27% I mentioned in the, in the uh, recapping the parapet walls, where it's mostly labor. So for some of those, those projects like painting or the, or the masonry projects where labor is a big component of the job, what, what kind of percentages are we looking at in terms of what percentage of the project cost represents the labor? I would say in some of those cases as much as 70 to 75 percent of the of the cost is labor and in okay. some cases maybe even a little bit more you know in Snyder County a living wage for my constituents is 14 15 dollars an hour why would I want to pay them 30 to 35 dollars an hour for doing something they normally make 14 to 15 dollars an hour for it they're doing the same job okay thank you uh, representative Cutler Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Whalen, you had referenced the uh, project that you did uh, where you had contributed $25,000 and essentially it increased the cost by $15,000. We've had similar occurrences in Lancaster County where we've had projects, libraries, or you know, other, other investments uh, where we've actually had groups turn down county money or, or any kind of involvement because of the triggering of prevailing wage rates. My first question is, were you the only uh, participant that triggered that rate in that and then have you ever had any experience with groups turning down money uh, because of the prevailing wage rates? Ironically we just had one uh, the uh, there's a new YMCA that's going to be uh, in fact we just had the groundbreaking last week I believe and um, great project it's on the pathways to health out at our new Susquehanna Health Campus um, a lot of synergy, a lot of help for the neighborhood that it's going to be in, uh, really going to benefit the whole county. And boy, we really wanted to help them. And, you know, we really had to stay away. We had to get a little creative. You know, we're going to pay for their sewer and water uh, tap on fees. But, you know, right there is a great example where, you know, we could not help them without invoking, without driving up the overall cost of the Y, which in today's world they're having trouble enough gathering up the money to construct such a building. So yeah, there's a great example. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Keller. Thank you for your testimony, gentlemen. Uh, just a couple things I'd like to, like to discuss here. Uh, Commissioner Whelan, you actually in your testimony included a uh, little chart in the back of it. And it, it has in Lycoming County, and it has prevailing wage. Um, when you're talking about what we pay for prevailing wages, uh, this isn't only speaking to the wage, but also the wage fringes. Is that correct? That's correct. So you pay both of those added together. That's correct. So um, you know, a plasterer would make twenty-seven ninety-one plus seven seventy-five. In that case, the fringes are, you know, about a fourth you know, a third to a fourth of what, uh, what the actual rate is, but some of these are much higher. Uh, do you know how they, I mean, do you, do you know how they determine what the fringes are on these? That I do not know. I think I would refer you back to the Pennsylvania Boroughs Association, okay. which I'm sure you can well, get there, almost instant contact with okay. them and they could explain it. 
I, I come from and private I industry. At the bottom, it has estimated fringe benefits. Right. I, I come from private industry, and I, we had a formula for figuring our, our fringes, and we paid uh, training, uh, we paid for health insurance, we paid for paid vacations, and we paid for all these other things. And we figured about 1.36%, you know, if you multiply that, that's your wages and, and fringes. And I, and I took the one up here, the bricklayer. Uh, the fringes here would be like 40-some dollars an hour. And uh, I'm in the mid-30s, mid to high 30s, with 1.36. So here again, people that are working paying the taxes, to your, to your point here, and I guess my point, I just wondered about that, but I'm more or less making a statement now. From my experience in paying, you know, we talk about training and everything else. In private industry, we had to do OSHA training. We had to do all these kinds of training. We trained our employees. We provided a quality product. Yet we did not overcharge for these things, and I guess I just wondered: uh, do, do you know? Do, do they say anywhere on their website what's in, what they can pay with these fringes? Uh, no, sir. Again, I'd have to defer to the boroughs okay. association and, and maybe some that maybe that some of together. the people later on can help us with that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Fair enough. Thank you. Or uh, I can, you know, if you just contact me, I can. Okay. Fire some information back to you on it. I appreciate that. But as that. far as fringes, I know at county, whenever we you know, uh, make a hire, you know, our rule of thumb is 30% fringes. Yeah, but well, in private so, industries, 1.3, I think we, we figured yeah. 1.36, so. Uh, Commissioner Kantz, uh, I, I do know of the project on the Snyder County Courthouse because I've driven by, by it several times on my, my way around the district. Uh, and I do appreciate the fact that uh, the local governments are looking out for everybody, the workers, the taxpayers, and everybody. Uh, but you had mentioned something, and I, I guess I just wanted to sort of circle back around here. And it's a statement you made with the, uh, the worker when he said, well, when I'm working on this one, it just might uh, last a little bit longer. I mean, I know it's sort of said that way, but... Sure, and, and it was said that way. And, but you have to understand, he's an hourly laborer mm -hmm. who's just doing his job. It, and in, in that case, it didn't affect the taxpayer any more because we were on a bid. Mm -hmm. Who did it affect? It affected his employer at that point because he's getting paid $30 an hour when normally he'd be making $15 an hour. So guess what? If it takes him a half hour longer every day for kind of taking his time, that's coming out of the bottom line of the employer, the company that's doing the bid for the county. It's not costing the taxpayers any more on that bid because we have a solid bid and the total price tag in that case was $133,000. In that case, it's coming out of his employer's pocket. To be fair, I mean, it's not costing the taxpayers any more. We're already paying the prevailing wage on that job. We're already getting hit with that overage cost of 26000 or whatever it was more. You know, it's, in that case, it's coming out of his employer's pocket. I have a question. If you were doing work at your home, uh, would, you, would you pay the prevailing wage or would you pay the wage that's the market in your area? I would pay uh, what the market bears, and I mean, and you would if get my quality. neighbor was getting the kitchen, and I'm getting the same kitchen. It's like he's paying forty thousand, and I'm paying, you know, twenty five thousand. That doesn't seem really fair. Okay, uh, okay. I just, like I said, I just wanted to sort of illustrate the point, make sure I understood, you know, that that wasn't necessarily the case that it's going to take him longer, but it could. And in that instance, he's actually uh, would be harder to manage if I were a contractor. And I think we have some contractors coming up. Maybe I'll save that question for them. Thank you. Representative Truitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I just wanted to comment on the fact that uh, I think earlier it was kind of suggested that these hearings aren't very useful, and I want to reassure you both that your time has been valuable. Uh, one of the things that happens over the course of many years is we get about a 10% uh, turnover in the legislature every two years. So I was looking at the group of people on this panel, and there's almost all of us have been here for about three years or less. And so it is useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it is useful to to hold these hearings periodically, and and I myself had wondered why are we having four hearings in one year, but it's also helpful because as I was driving up here today, I was noting to myself the differences in this area versus the area that I come from. Every area is different, so it's nice to get the local flavor on issues like this. And sometimes because of schedules and other reasons, it's good to have multiple hearings so that we can all get in and have the opportunity to hear these things. 
and I want to thank you in particular. As I said, I woke up this morning and I was thinking, I'm sorry, I got a three hour drive ahead of me. Is this really going to be worth my time? And I appreciate both of your testimony, but your point about the differences between prevailing wage and Davis Bacon is something we haven't heard before in this series. And uh, so that was made it, made it worth the three hour drive up and the three hour drive back. So thank you for that. Uh, the only question I have for both of you, and you may not have an answer for this, but it's something that I've been digging into as we go through these hearings, is we'll hear examples where we're going to pay a worker $15 an hour if they're not on prevailing wage or $30 per hour if they are on prevailing wage. Uh, and Representative Keller kind of touched on this. Do you have an idea what that rolls up to in the end, not just after benefits, but you've got the contracting firm's profit and other expenses that all get rolled into it so that in the end that $15 an hour is probably going to get billed to a municipality or a local government at $45 or $50 an hour. What does the $30 an hour get billed to? Can you give us a sense, does, does everything roll up to 100 percent, or is there, do you have any numbers, not, not at the cost level, what, what the individuals are being paid, but what the municipalities are being billed? I think it goes back to, again, the area in which you live. If you're living in, let's say, Berks County, not far removed from Philadelphia, where you have a much higher cost of living and a much higher wage rate, and, and whether or not, I don't know if that's because of the unions, you know, forcing those labor rates up over the years, but the fact is it, it costs more to operate a business in Philadelphia than it does in Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. You know, my cost of living is much less. My constituents' cost of living is much less. And in theory, in, in reality, their wages are much less as, as a whole. You know, my, in Snyder County, the average household income is about $44,000. Well, people in Philadelphia think that's crazy. They probably think we're living in poverty in central Pennsylvania, when actually we live very well. And I wouldn't trade it for the world, because in central Pennsylvania, we can get by on $44,000 a year average household income. So why would we pay that worker what equates to $70,000 a year or $60,000 a year, when $15 an hour is an average living wage in central PA, not $30, which is where the labor rates are set based upon, you know, the labor rates cumulatively from all of the urban areas of the state as well. They shouldn't calculate into those prevailing wages. Me personally, I don't think we should have prevailing wage at all, but that, that's a whole other issue. Would you like to add anything to that? Again, you know, as county commissioners, uh, you know, we put a pro every project's different, you know. But to me, once again, it is just so frustrating, you know. Uh, and probably everyone at that table before me campaigned on the fact that you were going to spend taxpayers' dollars wisely, you know. And it's just so frustrating to me to have to have so many infrastructure projects shelved. Um, that that could be completed not all of them obviously sometimes it's like peeing in the ocean and expecting a result but you have you have you know here in Lycoming County like I testified before over a billion that's B is and boy that's a lot of money billion dollars worth of infrastructure projects and just you know the only ones that that we're able to afford be, and not, again, just because of prevailing wage, but, you know, there's so many more of these projects. If, if there was just a moratorium on prevailing wage that we could fund some other projects, you know, uh, we have structurally deficient bridges that we're going to have to start closing. Well, we have, have a couple of them closed already. You know, we could certainly use that $200,000 from pushing dirt around over there to take care of that particular small structurally deficient bridge. But, you know, it's just project after project after project that has to be put on the shelf because there's not enough money to go around. And we promise to spend taxpayers' money wisely, and this is not a good example. Federal government has us beat. And, and so fundamentally you're saying that if you didn't have to pay quite so much on individual projects, you would just do more projects. So we would, while some people would be earning less, we would have more people employed because it's not like you're just going to take that money and stick it in the bank or something like that. You're going to, you have enough projects backed up to, to put more people to work if you could spread the money farther. Well, I told you that we have a lot of projects that have to be shelved. We're going to have to buy more shelves to put all these projects on because, you know, as we ignore these infrastructure issues, 
you know, it's not like you freeze frame them and, and nothing else starts to wear out. I mean, it's a snowball that's picking up momentum. And as we all know, when you roll a snowball, it collects and it gets bigger. And that's what's happening with these infrastructure projects. So again, I, you know, uh, respectfully request the consideration of a five-year moratorium on it so that we can get this log jam of projects moving. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Snyder. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it is nice to see my former colleagues here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, before I took office in January, I served as a county commissioner for nine years. And uh, Commissioner Kantz and I have had many conversations about this, and we have uh, agreed to agreeably disagree. But I would just like to bring a little perspective from my nine years of experience as county commissioner. And it could be demographically different, and it could be about geography. But I know there were many projects in my county, and Greene County is a small rural county, and many times we would have a project that we wanted to do, and we would factor in labor costs, and we would factor in construction costs, and we would have a budget that we knew would be workable until we had to get into the professional services end, and the architectural needs, and the engineering needs, and then those costs took it off the charts. And when you talk about shelving a project, Commissioner Wheeland, we had to shelve many projects because when you factored in the professional services, we couldn't afford to move forward. We also had many projects that we did, and we had contractors on the job that wouldn't submit their certified payroll to see if they were paying prevailing wage. And many times, they weren't, and their workers didn't know they weren't even entitled to prevailing wage on the job. That money wasn't going back to the taxpayers. That money was going in that contractor's pockets. So that's why I'm a little skeptical about even if we were to wipe out prevailing wage tomorrow, whether or not it's going to save your taxpayers one cent. I'm not convinced it will. But my question to the two of you, my friends and former colleagues, would you favor a cap on professional services on a county level for engineering and architectural fees? Um, well, one thing I didn't mention in my testimony, Representative Snyder, is that we actually hire a, a professional engineer for the county on all the projects that I mentioned. So those costs were very minimal in the, in the total scope of things. Um, and, and they were above and beyond the, the numbers that I mentioned. Um, as far as the um, cap, I'm not sure how that would work. I've never looked at it before because we haven't had exuberant costs for engineering services. We, we've got a good local engineer that treats us very fairly. Um, and if they didn't, we'd hire someone else. <laughs> so. Um, and I was trying to think of your, your first point. Um, oh, you know, I don't know how it is in Greene County, but in Snyder County, we're, we're required on prevailing wage jobs to follow regulations, and the contractors must turn in complete paperwork as to how much their workers made, what the fringe benefits were. We have to do that. I believe it's a law that we have to do that, so we, we always have. And we did, too, but sometimes the contractors weren't paying it, and we had battles on our hands. Well, I was going to say, I think that would then become a liability for your county. It was, yeah. and we ended up in litigation many times. I guess so there you had attorney fees. You know, I mean, there's a lot to be considered. I don't know if maybe people are <laughs> a little more honest. <laughs> we, we, we've never had that problem, to my knowledge. But contractors but might have been from Snyder County. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I know on our engineering, our professional servicing uh, agreements and engineering projects that require engineers, um, you know, we, we put all that out for bid. And boy, a lot of starving engineers out there. So we've been very successful in keeping our cost very low on the engineering services for Lycoming County. Representative Galloway. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wheeland, Commissioner Kantz, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, there's no suggestion that your time is wasted. That was not my intent. Um, and thank you for your service. I just want to go over a couple things quickly. Um, Mr. Kantz, Commissioner Kantz, you mentioned a glass company, Snyder County. What was the name of that company? Glass company? Didn't you mention a glass company, a glazing company? We did, a, we did windows, 
uh, window project, yeah. but that was a general contractor that took care of the entire project. So they purchased windows for our courthouse. I believe it was, um, I might be off on the number, but about 66 windows around the outside edge of the courthouse. And that was part of their bid as materials. Okay, thank you. Um, do you agree that if private contractors participated in submitting their wage data, that prevailing wage could be lowered? I'm not sure how that would work. Well, people who don't participate would submit their data. The people who are paying less in wages would submit their data. It would be counted. Are you aware that non-union contractors don't submit data? They, the prevailing wage data you're using does not have non-union contract data in it? I guess I don't understand what the benefit to them would be to submit that data. I'm looking for the... Okay. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to belittle people. I'm really... You're talking about a private contractor, correct? Correct. Okay. I'm talking about non-union contractors who do not submit their wage data. I'm asking you, if they did submit their data, you're would the prevailing wage be lower? You're talking about a prevailing wage job? Yes. Oh, well, in that case, I've answered that question. All of our private contractors who do prevailing wage work must, rec must submit prevailing wage data on that specific job. I, that, I, we, Representative Snyder and I just talked about that. I, we've never had anybody not, because if they weren't, they won't be following the regulations. I think they submitted just to the municipality. Who did they, who did they submit that data to? That is submitted through to the county commissioner's office on a county okay. project. Now, you, you are aware that the prevailing wage rate is not done at the county level, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. So what good does it do to, to submit it to the county? It's required to be submitted to us as the, okay. as the, uh, the honest, customer. Uh, honestly, again, what I'm trying, trying to get at is simple. If they submitted it to the state, which is where the prevailing wage data comes from, right? The only people submitting the data are union contractors. If non-union con okay, no. uh, then we disagree. No, no, you're asking, if we have a, pers a contractor doing our, let's say our window project. They're submitting it to you. They're submitting it to us. They're not union contractors, though, in our case, in our county. We've never had one union, union shop bid on any of our projects. They're non-union private workforce laborers they submit their prevailing wage data to the county as required by law. As my understanding, maybe the law needs changed, which then that would be, I guess, your job to take care of that one. But um, they do submit that data to us as required. We talked about a demolition project. It was kind of laughed at as you were demolishing something. Um, you are aware of the catastrophic incident that happened in Philadelphia just a couple of months ago where seven, eight people died because of the people doing the demolition were not qualified. You, do, you were aware of that, right? I think that gets, was, I'm the one that brought up the demolition project and uh, the county, it's a city project, the county worked very closely with the city to do that. Um, I will tell you that, that uh, there was uh, a very diligent process uh, that was, as we picked out who was going to do, or as the city picked out who was going to do the demolition, um, you know, they had to have uh, a lot of information provided along with a lot of insurance, um, a lot of uh, experience had to be required. In other words, although, you know, the, the, the you folks up front there, I'm sure you could spread dirt with a little bit of practice. Uh, demolition was is different, you know. I mean, obviously, you have to be qualified and, and to take that, that down. I'm not trying to take into account. Um, I, I just want you to understand, it was brought up in the context of quality of work. Um, and it's a difficult irony that we just went through one of the worst catastrophes in demolition examples that just happened just a couple months ago because of shoddy quality work. I need to go back to Commissioner Kantz. 
you keep saying that they submit their data to you. They're not submitting the data to the state. <laughs> That's the whole point. That's what prevailing wages is determined. Well, you understand my point is we're doing what we're required to do by law. I so. agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. But prevailing wage is determined at the state level. It's done by contractors who submit their data. And the only person, people submitting their data are union contractors. So we agree. And you, you're aware of that. I, I would, I, and, I would it, and if everybody that's submitted true, their data, would the, would the prevailing rate be lower? That's my question. It's been my question since the beginning. You don't think so? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, if they're not doing all right, right I can't all right, make that all right. yes. one, one last question. I, I, and, and it was brought up over and over again passionately by Commissioner Whelan, and I appreciate this. Because th this, is, this is what is happening in Harrisburg today. Transportation. Infrastructure. All right? The governor's begging for a bill called Senate Bill 1. Senate Bill 1 is a Republican bill passed by, I believe, Senator Rafferty. Senator Yaw, the, the, the state senator from this district, voted for it. It's a $2.5 billion infrastructure project. I support it. I think Pam supports it. Representative Snyder supports it. I'm ready to vote for it. The governor wants it. The Senate already passed it. $2.5 billion to get these projects off the shelf. There's only one group of people who oppose it who are stopping all of it. Now, I'd like to go down the table right now and ask everybody, you want these projects done. You asked for it over and over and over again. You talk in your testimony about state dollars that are dwindling. You can't go on with infrastructure projects. You talk about bridges collapsing. Who on this panel wants to vote for Senate Bill 1? The governor wants it. The Senate already voted yes. It's sitting in their hands right now, sitting in committee. Who wants to vote for it? I'm a yes. I think we'll get a chance on Monday. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to get into speculation on how members are going to vote. Do you have further questions, I, Mr. Again, again uh, I, what, you want money for, in, for infrastructure? You want money for transportation? <sighs> then you're going to need to convince the people on this panel to vote yes. And so far... They've told everybody, including the governor and the Senate, that they're not going to vote for it. They want Democrats to vote for it. That's what they want. They've come to us and said, you know what? Mr. We Ch want Mr. you to vote for it because Mr. it's Galloway, a tax could, increase. Mr. Gallagher, would you suspend uh, I'm not, for a second? Hold on. I, you know, I, I drove three hours to get here, member. and I'm almost finished. Mr. Gallagher, I, They want us member. to vote for a $2.5 billion tax increase so they can keep their pledge Mr. and not Galloway, raise the tax. Would you please suspend. I have an inquiry from another member. Representative Truitt. Mr. Chairman, I believe the purpose of these hearings is to hear from testifiers and collect data, not to make political points. And ironically, Mr. Galloway started off by saying he wasn't going to be taking cheap shots today, and that's all he's been what doing. That was a cheap shot. Are you going to vote for the bill or not? The governor would like to know. Thank, thank you, Representative Galloway. We're going we're gonna to move on. Our time for these witnesses has expired. I do want to advise both of you guys. And Representative Galloway had a point about the, the, the contractor data. If, in fact, the, uh, the competitive data from non-union contractors uh, is, if it's submitted to the state and it, and it brings the, the prevailing wage rate down, that might be an indication that the union contractors submitting the data now uh, do have uh, higher prices than the, market, the marketplace rates. So that, that might be helpful. There is a bill that Representative Delosier, one of my colleagues from Cumberland County, has introduced that would in fact allow the private contractors to enter that data in the state system on a confidential manner, much like is done with the Davis-Bacon data, to encourage them to do so. Right now there's, a, there's an issue with confidentiality which, which detracts from many of these contractors being willing to submit that data. But it's a good point. And I also wanted to just mention before you depart uh, the local option bill. We just moved that out of committee yesterday. And my understanding from legislative leadership is that's a bill that it's going to be moving on a fast track here this fall in the legislature, so I continue to express your, your support for that if you're so inclined. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. We need to move on to our next witnesses. Thank you. And uh, that would be township managers and supervisors, Mr. Fry, Mr. Horner, and Mr. Burdett.
And I would encourage you gentlemen, as well as the first set, if you're able to summarize your testimony, uh, that'd be ideal. And you can proceed in, in the order that you're listed on the agenda. Thank Mr. Thank Fry. You. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak before this panel. Uh, listening to this last session, uh, I really feel sorry for you guys sitting up there. It's brutal. I can't believe it. Listen, I got a question. How many of you at this panel has ever been a township supervisor? I thought so. No disrespect. You have to get out of your ivory towers and get down on our level. I have a budget of 450000 a year to run a township that has 1,000 residents that pay the bill. These people bitch and complain, and I will keep my language clean. They say that we charge them six, $700 a year for taxes. They forget to look at the second line. The township part is $17.45. What can I do with that? Nothing. Meaning prevailing wage in our township level and the rural areas in central PA, north PA, are less than our budget. We can't do a thing. We're doing a project now only because, thank God, of Marcellus Shale. We're right in the midst of it. Our township has received a lot of money to finally get ahead. Our township roads are pie crust. Do you understand what pie crust is? It is a tar and chip of two or three years in a span of maybe five years, six years. They break up, they go away. When the gas people came to our township, they worked on our roads for one week. We didn't know what they were up to. We knew they were there. We want to bond our road. Okay, we'd let them do it. Inside of a week in the rainy season, they had bulldozers pulling the trucks through the road at two feet deep. Now, residents aren't going to go through that. They can't figure out what in the world happened to the road that a supervisor allowed it to happen. We never had a book on Marcella Shale, what they do and how they do it. 500 trucks, 2,000 white pickups, and no regard for basically anything. My point in the whole thing is, when you're looking at prevailing wage from a little, little township, it kills us. We can never afford to do any projects. And the biggest complaint that we have is the maintenance. Get prevailing wage out of the maintenance side. Allow us to reconstruct a road, a pie crust road that needs milled, <coughs> is not widening the road, it's not altering the width, all it's doing is reconstructing the top. I'm going through that project right now. And believe me, without prevailing wage, I could do more, but I can't. I am very appreciative that in our township, I have those many residents, I have 37 miles of road to take care of. I have 25-year-old trucks. It doesn't work well, fellas, at 2 o'clock in the morning that you try to go out there and get your junk running to go out and plow and send her a road. The point is, we can no longer set back and let these roads deteriorate or we're going to grade them back to dirt and everyone will run on dirt. I have one paved road in our township before the gas ply came. That's in pretty good shape right now. But since they have come five years ago, we have, they have spent over $12 million in Coke and House Township, a little out of the way township that nobody knows about. Can you believe that? I'll bet PennDOT and Harrisburg just shakes her head. Where in the world did they get that much money to spend? Well, the gas companies did it for us. Every road they done, did it complete, did it right with engineers. We got wonderful roads now. I only have a couple left that's not paved, and that's the one I'm stuck with. 
I don't care, but I don't have a million two to fix it. So what do I do when the residents sat in front of me and beat me up? I don't have an answer. I need some relief. In our small township, I wish each and every one of you could come and run a township for one month and see what little bit of money you have to go for the whole year to budget things. Prevailing wage in our little area is just not acceptable. Outside of Philadelphia, I don't care about down there. I don't care about anywhere. I care about our township in Lycoming County. I'm a business owner. I have been in the city of Williamsport for 23 years. I got my rear end handed to me on a silver platter about two months ago on prevailing wage. There was a project out. We bid it. Two bidders. The other guy's price was 50 some thousand. Mine was almost 90. And they looked at me like I was totally incompetent. What in the world happened to you? You're always competitive. It's prevailing wage. How did that guy get it? Had family, didn't have to pay it. Beat me up to death. So tell me there isn't ways around prevailing wage. They are. Let's say there's a contractor job out, needs 10 men. They should have 10 men on. So that contractor may say, I'll pick seven of my best, put them on the job so I can help absorb some of the cost and make a little more money on that project. He isn't required to put 10 out there. They think they need 10, but they're only going to use seven or eight. I've been on prevailing jobs. Believe me, before my business, they would put you out there, but you're not out there very long, and the first minute that they're not, you are not needed, you're out of there. Prevailing wage only helps a few people in our area, like on small projects. There might be eight or 10 people, but it's not a month. It might be a week if they reconstruct the road for us. It's not long term. It's a shot in the arm, but it's not a very big shot in the arm. My neighbor works on the project right over here on the hill where they're excavating the hill. He's a mechanic, $31 an hour. He gets at prevailing wage over there. He works in the garage, but it's the same work he's doing, basically mechanicing, but it's for half of the money. But he's still doing a quality job. You talk about quality. Quality, like in my job, I would have done that job for about fifty or 60000 that I previously talked about. And the quality of work would have been the same because I do the same every job. The quality in that case would not have been compromised. So our point in this whole discussion, you've got to understand us little people out here. This is where it really bites. I'm a member of the Lycoming County Planning Commission. I'm, I'm vice president of the uh, board of supervisors in the county. I own my own business. And I can tell you, you see it every day. It is really to the point where the can is getting pretty well dented from being kicked up and down the street for three years. You cannot continue to allow this to keep going. You have to give somebody some relief someplace. A local contractor, we had a salt and cinder shed bid come out. Last year, I called our local contractor. He came up and gave me a price of $48,000 just to build a shed over cinders so they don't freeze. This, this last spring, this summer, we had it bid at $77,000 due to prevailing wage. I didn't make the rules. I had to abide by them. I wanted to get that local contractor. I knew his quality of work. I'd known him for 20 years. What would be wrong with getting him, then I can take the extra money and go do something else with it. That's the whole key for us, me, opinion for me, down here on the lower echelon as a small township supervisor. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Thank you. Mr. Horner. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, chair, chair, are you chairman? Sir. Chairman Bloom. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to give testimony, and I will. I, I'm a township supervisor in Chapman Township, Clinton County. I chair the board, and I'm also vice, first vice president of the State Association of 
of townships of the second class and also the chairman of the executive board of PSATs. And we represent 1,455 municipalities and basically uh, I uh, would echo, I will cut my, uh, my uh, comments short because I echo the same comments that the last presenter mentioned. Uh, we do support uh, House Bill 796. We would like to see it amended uh, to 189,000 with the prevailing wage uh, limit raised because of, of the 1960, since the cost of living has changed since 1963. And uh, we would also like to see, we also support H Bill, H House Bill 665, which would remove uh, general maintenance work off of our township uh, roads that we could, we wouldn't have to pay for any wage on general maintenance. So basically that's, and and as, as mentioned in my uh, comments here, I, I do take care of a small water company and we have serious problems with uh, leaking pipes because it's an old system and we can't we cannot afford the cost uh, with prevailing wage involved to replace a lot of these this piping because of the higher cost and uh, we just band-aiding it right now just keeping it together to provide water for our residents so and we have other other projects we'd like to do but we just can't find the money we're only a township of 848 population so it's tough and not basically it you have a copy of my total testimony here Appreciate thank you mr horner and mr burdett Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Bill Burdett. I'm the township manager <clears throat> and the treasurer for Loyal Sock Township. Loyal Sock is uh, just to the east of the city of Williamsport, population of 12,000, and uh, we have a large commercial area just, again, just to the east of the city of Williamsport. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about the effects of prevailing wage on local governments. Um, in Loyal Sock Township, we have 66 miles of roadway that we maintain. Most of it is paved. I think all but about a mile and a half of that is uh, paved roadway. And the, the impacts of prevailing wage on paving have been significant. I think it was either 2007 or 2008 where the ruling changed and uh, paving and milling became, or, or I guess the uh, classification changed from maintenance to construction, and then we were uh, required to use prevailing wages for those bids. Um, that year, our bids rose by 20%. And I know everybody's talking percentages, everybody's arguing, you know, is it 5%, is it 30%? I really don't think it matters. If it's 1%, why does the state legislator want us to have to pay more to maintain public roads? In the state of Pennsylvania, I did a little research. In our state, we are ranked 38th in the nation in one study that I researched. Two other studies, we didn't do so well. We were ranked 43rd out of the nation in maintenance of our roadways. So I think that's something that the uh, legislature needs to consider when considering this. Shouldn't we be putting all the money that we have available, which is never enough anyway, but shouldn't we be putting all of that money available into maintaining our roadways in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? And if you do nothing else, I urge you to work to reverse that decision. That would be the most important thing you could do for local municipalities is try to reverse that decision. In addition, we do a lot of uh, projects in Loyal Sock Township. Uh, we do a lot of large projects. Uh, virtually none of them are under $25,000. So the prevailing wage law applies to anything that we bid out. Uh, I, I've been there 15 years. There may have been one project that uh, was under uh, the $25,000, but it was a community development block grant project which um, required it anyway. Um, I talked to our engineer, Larson Design Group, they're a local firm here in the Williamsport area, and they use a percentage of 20% on all projects. And what they explained to me was explained to you earlier. It depends on how much labor is on a job, uh, but they, when estimating costs, typically use about a 20% for any project that is publicly funded. And I guess, I guess what doesn't make sense to me, I'm not a political person, but what does not make sense to me is the same engineering firm is going to design a building for a bank or a hotel or a high-rise office building. The same firm is designing 
a senior center, a park, a school, um, roadways, water and sewer projects, and they go out to bid, why are we, it just, it seems backwards. The, the, the entity with money, the banks, the, the entrepreneurs, which I'm, I'm not against business, uh, they get a break, but the taxpayers, through our municipalities, the taxpayers pay more. And according to our engineer, I didn't make this up, uh, Larson Design Group estimates 20% more depending on how much labor and, and how much equipment is on a job. So again, uh, if we want to argue over the number, again, even if it's 2% or 5% more, why do we make local governments who are struggling pay more than what you make? Uh, you, don't, you don't have any limits on, um, on private enterprise. So um, most of my other comments have already been made. Um, you've had a lot of these hearings, so I'm sure you've, you've heard pretty much everything else, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, guys. Uh, all good, good testimony from all three of you. We have some questions from the panel. Representative Keller. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Just, uh, just a quick question. I guess I'll ask it for the whole panel. We have, a, we have a bill that we just brought out of committee yesterday, House Bill 1538, Senator, or, uh, yeah, Senator, I just gave him a motion, didn't I? Uh, Representative Miller's bill. Uh, if you were given the choice to opt out of the Prevailing Wage Act, for your municipality, would you? Yes. How soon? Would it be something that you'd wait to act on, or would you act Yesterday. on immediately? Yesterday. Okay. Uh, we do it immediately before we let our next contract. Exactly. Okay, thank you. I, I just have one other question, and it's for Mr. Fry. You had mentioned that uh, that you have you have your own business. Yes. Um, so you you have employees. Yes. Five. Uh, five. You have, I'm okay. a small company. You're a small company. Yes. Your, your fringes, what do you figure for fringe, fringe benefits rate? Ah, don't go down that road. I have no fringes. <laughs> okay, sorry. I pay holidays, I, but I don't have health insurance because we cannot afford it unless Obamacare forces us, but I don't have that many employees. But I'm serious. It, I'm a small business. So your people that, that, are, uh, that are paying the bill aren't getting any, aren't getting any no, don't sir. have any fringes. Thank you. Representative Cutler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, testimony. Certainly appreciate it. Uh, my question is actually for Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry, you, you indicated that the gas companies have essentially rebuilt all of your roads. Correct. Uh, do, you, do you know what, ra what wage rates they happen to pay? We were not advised of that because they were doing it on, uh, in their own way with another contractor. Okay. We weren't privy to any of okay. that, and they just come in and done the work and presented their information for us. And we really didn't have a whole lot of say in that. Quite all right. I, I was just curious if you were happy with the quality. Very, very happy. And the thing is, with the gas companies, they said if it goes bad, we'll redo it. And they have. They've spent $3 million this spring repaving some roads that really broke up over the winter. So they are true to their word. All right, very, very good. I, and I know we're tight on time, so I'll, if it's okay, I'll contact you separately. Maybe we Correct. can get a hold of the gas companies. I'd be curious to see if they, as a private company, paid prevailing wage rates or not. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Representative Truitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I have more of a comment than a question. Just want to, when you asked that question, have any of us been township supervisors? The lack of hands was probably a little startling to you, but I want to reassure you there are a number of former township supervisors and township officials within the General Assembly as a whole. One of the beauties of the General Assembly is that it's made up of a people with a diversity of backgrounds. I myself, I believe, am the only professional engineer in the General Assembly. And we have a number of attorneys, a number of township supervisors, a number of teachers, and that's kind of what makes it work, is we go back, we take this testimony that we have from you, we digest it, and we go back, and we'll talk to people who are former township supervisors to get a deeper understanding of the issue. But uh, you don't worry, you, you didn't offend us by, no, your, by, by asking nobody. that question. And, and I want to thank all three of you for your testimony. It was definitely worth the time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we'll have the next panel come up. Thanks again for your testimony. And we're going to switch. We have to, uh, we have a scheduling conflict. It's going to require a shift in the schedule. If we could have our business representatives, Jason Fink and Crystal Bristol, come up in lieu of the uh, education official, Dr. Nade.
And thank you very much. And Mr. Fink, if you want to proceed with your testimony. Okay. Uh, you all have a copy of it, uh, so I won't uh, read it to you. I uh, just wanted to point out, first of all, Jason Fink uh, with the Wayne Sport Like I mean, Chamber of Commerce. I also serve as executive vice president for our industrial properties corporation here in Lycoming County. And we have uh, worked on a number of projects as a conduit uh, for uh, financing of uh, state-funded projects uh, to be able to assist with uh, companies who are doing projects in a community. Uh, and we're the ones who undertake the work on behalf of a public entity uh, to be able to assist, for example, recently we worked on an IDP grant. Uh, that's no longer a, a program within the Commonwealth, but uh, we're wrapping up uh, the end of that. And it was to assist a township uh, that was having uh, some industrial development take place. And that program funded industrial, uh, or excuse me, public works projects uh, that were being impacted by industrial development in a community. For example, where this project was taking place was in the eastern end of the county in Representative Everett's uh, district. Uh, the township uh, had a road, the prior supervisor was speaking about um, pancaked roads, and uh, this was a, a road that was similar in nature. It was going to need to be upgraded to deal with the increased traffic that was going to be coming from this industry. They were bringing 600 jobs to the community, and uh, their investment was being leveraged towards this grant. Uh, the grant could have gone directly to the company to aid them to assist the township. However, the reason why they uh, did not uh, directly access that and why it went to the Industrial Properties Corporation was because of prevailing wage. Uh, the escalator on their $50 million investment uh, would have impacted it by another 20%. Uh, you have projects like that that are taking place that are impacting the private sector as well uh, as the public sector. And, and, you know, as we sit here in this room right now, uh, if you're reading the local newspaper in the Wayne Sports Sun Gazette, they're talking about this building right now uh, that is in dire need of work. You see water stains right there. Uh, they have a new roof that needs to be done here. Uh, they don't have the money. You know, townships, we're, we're listening to townships. You have local municipal leaders at all levels, school districts as well that are being impacted by the fact that they don't have the money available. When you add another 20% on, like it or not, whether it's labor, whatever cost it is, you know, there are ways to be able to do this. Um, from the chamber side of it, we're advocating you take beyond the step that you're, you're looking at right now. We, we would recommend that you take and join the other 18 states who do not have prevailing wage. Uh, the fact of the matter is those states are able to do it. They're able to take on public works projects to be able to do them properly, safely. And, and I understand the fact that you know, we have the need to make sure that they are done quality as well as safely at the same time. If they're able to do it, why can't Pennsylvania do it? Um, you know, if we're not able to be able to compete, which we've heard other municipal leaders speaking about the fact that their hands are tied right now, industry needs to be able to have the public infrastructure to be able to continue to do their work. They're paying the taxes. Why not effectively utilize those taxes so that they're able to maximize those public works projects so that we can see more growth within the Commonwealth? Right now, you look at uh, the rankings of Pennsylvania uh, historically. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat administration. We have ranked very poorly in being able to attract new industry. And the reason being is because one of the issues, one of the issues is the fact that we have a very strained infrastructure, public infrastructure. If we were able to dedicate more resources to be able to accomplish more of those projects, everybody would win. Not only the companies being able to take on those projects, but ultimately, <laughs> They employ people, being able to get labor more opportunities to take on more public works, being able to add another 20% basically into those opportunities. So, again, you have my comments, and if there's any questions at the end. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Bristol. Good afternoon, Chairman Bloom, uh, Chairman Keller, and members of the House Labor and Industry Committee. My name is Crystal Bristol, and I live in Troyboro of Bradford County. I am a councilwoman on Troyboro Council, the chair of the General Government Committee, and I'm also the full-time business manager at Bristol Excavating Incorporated, um, my family's um, small business that's a trucking and excavation company. 
Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, you all have my submitted testimony, so I'll just paraphrase what I have to say. First, I'd like to share a history on our company. Um, it was started in 1989 by my father-in-law, Calvin Bristol, and he started off working on his own. A few years later, he hired several employees, and we've grown to 25 plus employees, um, over 100 pieces of equipment and trucks, and granted, a lot of our success is due to the development of the Marcellus Shale in our region, but prior to that, um, our work was generated by municipalities, farmers that had received state grant money, and school districts. I would like to address the issue of compliance and the administrative challenges that come with the current prevailing wage law. When we bid a prevailing wage project, the first thing we do is review the prevailing wage project rate sheet. This document is usually about 14 pages long and literally consists of 47 job classifications for building projects and 25 job classifications for heavy and highway projects. There are also five pages of classification definitions to back up these classes so that, for example, an employer can determine which of six labor classifications their foreman would fall under. If we are successful with our bid and are awarded the project, we then have the weekly challenge of compiling certified payroll reports. I'm the only employee that works in our office except for my part-time assistant. On a weekly basis, I execute payroll, employee benefits, accounts receivables and payables, advertising, new hire training, safety initiatives, estimates, contracts, and ensuring that we are in conformity with all the licenses and regulatory compliance that comes with working in our type of industry. I did a quick Google search before writing my testimony and have found 48 other excavation contractors in Bradford County alone. This confirms the fact that we have to stay very competitive in our bidding, and we're able to do that by keeping our overhead costs low, unfortunately at my expense. <laughs> when we take on a prevailing wage project, certifying payroll takes up a significant amount of, adm of administrative time that could be more effectively used elsewhere. The following paragraphs in my testimony cover um, several cost examples of projects that we have bid based on prevailing wage and um, as a private shop. Um, I'd like to spend the rest of my allowed time here on the floor to address some of the questions that I've heard um, from the panel earlier in the day and um, by watching previous uh, sessions that were held. Uh, the first question um, is in regards to submitting our wages to labor and industry. As I covered in my testimony, we have very valuable administrative time in our office, and I honestly have not had the chance to uh, look up how to go about submitting our private uh, closed shop wages. Um, my second concern I was addressed today is the privacy concern. Um, in Bradford County, of those 48 contractors that I mentioned, I don't think any of them have union shops, and only a handful of them do bid on prevailing wage jobs. If um, Joe contractor down the street knew what we were paying a truck driver, it, it would um, make us a lot less competitive in our local market. Um, back to my point about the valuable administrative time. In our industry, we are already overly regulated. Um, in a fleet of approximately 12 trucks, I have uh, IFTA, New York State Highway Use Tax, waste hauler uh, permits, motor carrier registrations, uh, PUC to comply with, United Carrier Registrations, DOT, apportion plates, filing 2290 information, and that's just on a fleet of 10 trucks. Um, you go into excavation and grading of land and you get into a whole nother area of regulation, and honestly the last thing I need is um, more forms to fill out and compliance, and it, it would admittedly help us. I mean, it would help the wage base in our area, but I think a lot of the other contractors are in the same boat that I am. Um, the second issue that I would like to address is work quality. The best way to ensure a high quality of work is for the project owner to properly screen contractors through a pre-qualification process, something that is not, to my knowledge, required by the Prevailing Wage Act. However, most project owners require the presence of surety bonds on projects. I do think that is a requirement of the Prevailing Wage Act to ensure that the contractors pay their bills to suppliers and complete the project in a satisfactory manner. Most contracts also require maintenance period of a year or more. That may also be a requirement of the Prevailing Wage Act. This is truly the most efficient way to ensure a project is completed successfully. Seeing as how surety companies require a rigorous qualification process, 
and don't tend to bond contractors outside of their proven capabilities. This takes the burden of researching contractors off of the project owners or the municipalities by simply requiring a bond. Simply paying higher wages does not ensure a higher quality of work. If that were the case, every time I needed to hire an employee, I could just go through a stack of applications and see who was making the most money at their previous job without taking into consideration their references and hire them solely on that fact. The fact is, is that hundreds of projects are successfully completed every day for private companies because the owner of the project take the appropriate action to screen contractors and require appropriate bonds. My final point is that um, in our area, prevailing wage does keep the work local. This is, um, we're located near the New York state border. So contractors from out of state frequently bid on our local projects using a prevailing wage based paycheck to entice employees to make a long unpaid commute to our backyards. Um, no part of the prevailing wage act requires better to be locally based or have a headquarters in Pennsylvania. If these employees weren't guaranteed such a high rate of pay, they would be a lot less willing to make such a lengthy commute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question for you, uh, Ms. Bristol. And this is, this is a, I don't know, this is not a question I know the answer to, I'm just curious. Has your company ever decided not to bid a project because of all this bureaucratic burden of compliance with the prevailing wage law? Has that actually yes. discouraged you from bidding? Yes. We, um, we had a very large privately held commercial project this year, along with three other medium-sized um, municipal projects that were held uh, under the prevailing wage act. And we um, looked at bidding on another road maintenance project actually in the borough of Troy <laughs> and did not bid on it because it was a prevailing wage and we already had our plate full with the other three that we had going on. For me to do three separate certified payroll reports a week um, is extensive. So it'd be fair to say that, that municipalities, governmental entities are literally getting fewer bids on their jobs because of the prevailing wage law, so that ultimately it's a less competitive yeah. environment and they may not be getting the best price. Correct. Like I said before, there's 48 contractors in excavation in Bradford County alone, and I can name five of them that actually bid on the prevailing wage projects. So when we do bid, we have a relatively high success rate because there aren't very many contractors that are bidding on it. Thank you. And that's uh, echoing what Representative Truett said earlier. We learn something new at every one of these hearings. I have personally not heard that that type of testimony yet and that's very important to know and I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Keller. Thank you for your testimony. I just have one quick question for Crystal. You'd, you'd mentioned uh, in your testimony about the fringe benefits and what you do with those. Um, you put them into I guess 401k for your employees. That's correct. Do you, do you know what other items that fringe benefits can be used for? I do. Uh, this is a certified payroll report that I fill out, and it actually says on the second page what items they can be used for. Uh, medical or hospital care, pension or retirement, life insurance, disability, vacation, holiday, or other. We actually do offer medical um, coverage to our employees. It's not through a traditional group health. We do more of a reimbursement program, and we can't count that towards our fringe benefits, so we do put the whole amount in their 401k. The other category, so where would I find out the information on what you can use other? I mean, that to me can be a pretty broad category. Honestly, I've never researched that. <laughs> okay. um, up until two years ago, I'd like to note that we did pay all of our fringe benefits cash. We paid them right in their paycheck as everything else. And that um, is the easiest way to do it, administratively speaking. But then you're paying uh, Social Security tax on it, Medicare tax on it, not to mention workers' comp insurance goes through the roof. So... Um, we did, and we did that for years, probably 10 years, because it was just too much work to transition it into a 401k. Um, but we did do that in the end, and the employees actually seem to be happier with it being done that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Truitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I, had, I have a specific question. How many employees do you have at your excavating firm? Right now, we have 25. 25. And I ask that question because it seems to me that the administrative burden, the smaller the company gets, the, the worse it gets. My own engineering firm, at, when it peaked, I had eight employees. So the kind of paperwork that you're talking about was a nightmare for me because every minute I didn't have quite enough paperwork to do to hire someone else to do it for me, but every minute I spent doing it was a minute that I couldn't spend or an hour I couldn't spend billing a client. And uh, so 
there's, I don't know what the magic number is where that starts to become palatable. Uh, I think it is eight, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, my, my second question is, is more generic. It's for both of you. I don't know if you'll, you'll be able to answer this question. But I'm wondering, I mean, I think there's a valid point about we have to try to get more accurate data to determine what the prevailing wage rate is. But I, what I'm trying to figure out is what's a reasonable way to get that data without adding more burden to businesses. And I don't know if either one of you have any have an opinion on the fact. I, b I would think that we're already on other forms collecting enough data from businesses that we, as a state, if we got somebody who was really good with a computer, should be able to extract data from one form that you're submitting and data from other forms that you're submitting and triangulate it and figure that out. But do you, I mean, it, do you think that we have all the data that's necessary, or is there a way that we could streamline something to make that? Uh you have unemployment compensation that they're required to collect. You have that information right there. That they, I mean, you can speak to it more directly. I don't handle it at our organization, but you have that uh, information. It is reported by the, the businesses, actually all organizations. And so from that aspect of it, you should be able to extrapolate that for what you're trying to achieve with this. Um, it, it's, it's just, I know having dealt with state agencies on different projects, there are firewalls or maybe not just firewalls, there's just the inability to be able to speak on certain projects. Uh, we, for example, had some uh, questions regarding some local tax issues and had uh, thought we would be able to gen uh, obtain that from the state. The county could not obtain that information, uh, even though it was a local county tax question to the state to help address an issue. Um, there are certain things, I, I don't know if that's something that legislatively per, is prohibited to be able to uh, get that information, but I mean, again, you all have the ability to make those changes if that is, but the UC2 form should be able to get that you that information. So. That's the one I was trying to, trying to remember, because I, I haven't had employees for a few years since I joined the General Assembly. It takes up virtually all of my time, so I don't have any employees right now. And, and I kind of remembered, I'm, I'm listing by individuals how much money they make. So the state has that information, and I, and I was trying to remember if they knew the job classifications of each of those people on that UC2. They do not. I also complete all of our payroll reports, so I'm very familiar with this form. And um, I, I think that it would be complex. I don't think that it would be something that you could do at the state level with the way the form is now. It, it lists a name, a social security number, and their total gross wage. Um, you don't know who's a truck driver, who's a laborer, who operates equipment off of that form. In addition, um, as a closed shop, our rates vary um, from the open shop, or I'm sorry, as an open shop, our rates vary from the closed shop contractors as I mentioned I'm on borough council and all of our non-uniform and uniform employees um, are, are in unions and their wages are based off of their job classification, their title. Whereas at Bristol Excavating, our pay, rate of pay is based off of experience and, um, and more specifically how long they've been with the company. So for example, if we hire a patrolman at the borough's police department, that gentleman or or woman would make um, one rate, whether he was just starting or there for seven years. He would get a cost of living increase, but that was the rate for the classification. Whereas our operators, say for a 15 ton excavator, can make anywhere from 15 if they're just coming into the industry, or $30 an hour, depending on if they've been with us for a few years and have a lot of experience. So to break that down on a form, is another reason why I haven't looked into submitting my wages because I wouldn't even know how to go about that. We don't just have one rate for someone that does one job. Okay. Another way you could find out too would be through your audits and your workman's comp that you would have a total, you wouldn't have an hourly rate or you wouldn't have a classification for the most part. Right, I do break my payroll down by classification, but it's not necessarily um, broken down in the same way as it is on the wage sheets. It would be broken down into grading or excavation of land or trucking or um, mixing off on a drilling rig or clerical, uh, but it still doesn't really match up to what the prevailing wage rate classifications are. Thank you. Representative Cutler. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Bristol, in regards to you had said the work class def definitions and the, the characteristics by how you would categorize workers, how difficult is that to categorize workers and what classification they might fall under? Uh, to be honest with you, I have a lot of business experience, but just came to Bristol Excavating five years ago um, because I thought it was going to be a nice, quiet, part-time job. This was back when we had eight employees prior to the Marcel Shale. But anyway, um, and once I started, I had no familiar familiarity with prevailing wage or how to do a certified payroll report, and it was all self-taught. There wasn't really anybody else in the area that knew how to do it because the contractors weren't bidding on those types of projects, but it's our family business, so we can't just not bid a job because I don't want to do the paperwork for it. <laughs> so when I was sifting through these pages that I referenced when I first started there and we bid on our first job, uh, it, it took countless hours of my time. Once you get it figured out, it's a lot easier to do, but coming from someone with a business background that didn't necessarily have any um, experience in excavation trucking, uh, it was very difficult. In that regards, does the state provide any kind of definitions at the state level, like an excavator does this or you know, um, labor does this? I actually have the definitions with me if you'd like to review them. But it, it's basically 15 ton equipment and higher is in one category. And then like the six labor classifications that I said, there's a flag person, a foreman, um, uh, there's different pipe layer, pipe fitter, uh, there's different classifications under each category that you have to make the determination as to as to what you um, what you have each employee doing. And then we have the challenge of 25 employees who are used to working on private jobs that go into a prevailing wage job and have to adjust the way that they fill out their time cards appropriately so that I don't have to figure out what they're doing every day and what job they're on. And, and finally, what, what happens if you misclassify one of those workers? Um, Actually, when I first started, the, what, what we did was you're required by the Prevailing Wage Act to post the rates, and we're also required to um, post the definitions. And I would talk to the group of employees that we were sending out on a job and say, you know, if you're doing this, you're doing this, and I'd give them a little like cheat sheet that would tell them what labor class to put on their time card. But I do require them to determine what class of of job they're working on, and they submit that to me. So I'm not determining it for them. Uh, we have been through two labor and industry audits since I've been at Bristol Excavating. Everything's been good, by the way. <laughs> and um, and we have talked about that before. You, you do have to back pay an employee if you classify them wrong. But that's, again, why we put the responsibility on the employee to tell us what they're doing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OK, thank you both. Excellent testimony. Thank you. And we are now ahead of schedule, but if our organized labor representatives, Mr. Siriani and Mr. Amaris, are ready, uh, you guys can come on up. <laughs> and, uh, Please don't be offended. I, I have to leave at 3 o'clock, so if you guys are talking and I get up and leave, you know it's not anything it'll you be, said. It'll be standard procedure, right? <laughs> <laughs> likely no, no, no. no, I'm just kidding. All right. No, no problem. We understand that. So, uh, uh, we took time out of our busy schedules, too. Um, if someone could bring me my glasses from back there, I see you look like. Oh, wait, I have them. Never mind, thanks. I have them. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't you see them without them. <laughs> <laughs> you um, can proceed at your leisure. Excuse me. I want to get rid of my gum because that's just so rude. Um, Thank you, members of the committee. Um, I understand that the two chairmen couldn't be here today for other commitments, and this has been a long, long haul of hearings, and uh, we thank the entire committee for organized labor to have the opportunity to testify in front of you on this important issue to all of our members who are taxpayers in the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. My name is, again, Frank Sirianni, President of the Pennsylvania State Building Trades Council, and uh, I represent 113 local unions and 16 regional councils, which collectively encompass uh, 136 construction workers in the Commonwealth, which is, uh, according to LNI statistics, a third of the construction workers uh, in, this, in this Commonwealth. We have uh, 3,500 signatory contractors, businesses, uh, that uh, we work in conjunction with in this 
Commonwealth, and we provide over $6.5 billion in health care benefits and over $40 billion in pensions uh, and annuities uh, to our members. So we're a real integral part of the econo economic function of this Commonwealth. Uh, the health care industry, again, $6.5 billion, that doesn't include uh, co-pays or deductibles. So, you know, we're part of everything that happens in every, every community and, and including uh, all the way up to, uh, what is the next town? Is there another town before you leave Pennsylvania up here? And there's got to be one more town before we leave this state, right? What is it? Does anyone up here know what that town is? No? Okay, well. There's a nice college up there that we do a lot of work on in uh, Mansfield, that's correct. And, uh, and it's, an, it's a beautiful campus. And, and you know, that's in the heart of the gas industry, uh, which I've heard a lot of uh, testimony about. But before I go into some testimony, which will be, I'm gonna try to give you some different information from the other four hearings. Uh, we oppose House Bill 1538 House Bill 796 and House Bill 665. I've sent each of you uh, correspondence to that effect, and um, we believe that there's uh, a need for the Prevailing Wage Act as it stands in the state of Pennsylvania, as the majority of legislators in this Commonwealth have for the past 52 years that we're discussing the threshold increase about. And, um, and I would like to say this for the record, that there is absolutely nothing in any of those three pieces of legislation that would guarantee one tax dollar savings, taxpayer dollar savings, in the way they're written or the way they'll be carried out. All it does was change a law that is devised to protect local contractors and state uh, commonwealth contractors and commonwealth taxpayers to help pre prevent lowball contractors from taking t tax dollar uh, tax dollars out of the state of Pennsylvania or out of the local area. So uh, we believe that a strong prevailing wage is good for the construction worker, good for the, the construction customer, the end user, the community, and for the Commonwealth. Uh, cutting workers' wages, if that's what this thing looks like, it's going to, I mean, if you're not going to cut the material price, you're not going to cut the engineer price, you're not going to put a cap on any of the uh, construction managers or any of the fees and uh, services that are associated with construction projects, um, and from the other hearings, when we kept hearing from uh, the boroughs, the townships, and the county commissioners saying, materials have gone crazy, uh, oil prices are high, we have to get rid of prevailing wage. Well, that's the wage. So uh, we're looking at this, it, it's, it's a mechanism to cut wages or, and the standards in areas where our contract, contracts have been negotiated in the free market with private companies in these markets. They're not negotiated with the state or anyone like that. It's, it's a free market wage that's negotiated in the market that it's used and our contractors work in those areas and they are not only participating in public projects but the majority of the work is in private work and that's how we maintain the prevailing wage because we do the majority of work that's reported on in those, uh, in those surveys and we do it on an annual basis. Our companies are not afraid to let other companies know what they pay an hour because we're proud of the fact that our companies pay a good wage, pay good benefits, and we're not trying to be the lowest and the cheapest and hide our rates so we can, so we can say, oh, well, no one knows. We'll get this job because we can have a race to the bottom. So um, in general, uh, along with our benefit program, we train over 8,500, right now, in a slow economy, we train over 8,500 apprentices uh, throughout each year. Now, you have to understand that's over 75% of all the apprentices in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Okay, so the training and education that we provide is monumental. We think that that's the jewel of Pennsylvania, that those construction workers and future business owners and estimators and engineers or wherever they go after their training, because there are programs where they get college credit, college credit for. You know, a lot of our programs, you come out of a program, you have a two-year associate's degree, and you can go forward with that and become a business partner, or, you know, you can remain just doing your craft, which a lot of people enjoy, and there's a, a real benefit to craftspeople in this, in this commonwealth. And so when you look at that, we train over 75% of all the apprentices in the state in all walks of life. 
and over 90% just in the construction industry. There's no one that comes close to what we do in training. Now, I do not want to say for the record that there aren't other good construction workers in the state of Pennsylvania because they're our future members. We want them to come to us, join our ranks, so they can get the good benefits and the good wages and all the things that we enjoy and retire with some dignity. So as I move forward, uh, the next largest or closest apprenticeship group to us has less than a thousand statewide apprentice apprentices. So um, and like I said, uh, there's a lot going on. I, you know, I really feel that cutting the standards or changing the standards in the areas that have been established uh, through the past 50 years is pretty much, and I don't think you're intending this, but I think it's an insult to the uh, American worker and to the construction worker especially because we're devaluating what we think they're worth. We're devaluating what we're perceiving a construction worker as. You know, I called a, I called a local plumbing co company out of the phone book the other day. Uh, and I said, hey, can you send a plumber over to my house? I got a problem. And uh, the first hour was $199, okay? Every additional hour was $99. Now, I don't know, you know if you've called a plumber lately or a, whoever, a glazer or whatever. It's not our rate. And we've tried to establish that through these hearings that the prices you're being charged in, uh, when we were in uh, Ferguson, Ferguson Township, I think we talked about the, the person that was called in to cut down a tree and, and the uh, Ferguson Township was charged $60 an hour. And they looked at us and they said, how can you justify that? I said, we can't. Abe went on to say, look, at the, the rate there for that guy who would have been cutting a tree is $18 an hour. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts in this, and I don't think that, you know, the, the legislators, legislature's intent over the past 50 years was in any way trying to make uh, the taxpayers who are construction workers in this uh, commonwealth suffer or have reduced wages. I would like to make some comments on the county commissioner's remarks uh, from Lycoming County. Uh, first of all, the county commissioner in that area makes over $52,000 a year plus benefits, okay, plus benefits. Now, if you divide that by 2080, if he works full time, that's over $25 an hour. He's telling us that the wage in that area is $14 an hour. So why is he making 52,000 and 25 bucks an hour? Why aren't we addressing that? Okay, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to go a little bit further. He told me that the other guy makes more than him. So, you know, and I don't want to really, you know, go after their wages and salaries. I think if they earn it, they earn it. We earn it, we want it. And we want our tax dollars back. And if we can get them by working on a state-funded project or a publicly funded project, we, we should have it. Okay, I heard another testifier. The gas companies came in and fixed all the roads they destroyed. Wow, wasn't that grand of them? Well, they're not paying tax on anything, you know. They're not paying a wellhead tax. Like West Virginia, I was in West Virginia last week and they're laughing at us up here. Hey, thanks for paying for the cracker plant we're gonna get down here. Shell's been talking to us too. And you're gonna pay for it by not charging them tax. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that I hear these things in other states. You know, it's, it's just scary. And then, then you, we hear commissioners, township supervisors, school boards complaining they don't have money. You're the guys that cut their funding. In the last four budgets, the budgets were reduced. They were reduced and they were reduced, and they don't have the money. You're not voting for a transportation bill. They would have the money to fix their highways. Okay, so where is prevailing wage relevant in all this? It has such a minute place in all of this. Let's not l look at working people's wages and try to cut them. Let's try to elevate the workers in Pennsylvania. Let's try to put them on a pedestal because they're paying your salary. I think they deserve a good wage, and I think you're, you have an obligation to pay them a good wage. Jason Fink. Jason Fink. Are you still here, Jason? I don't know. He took off. He gets $50,000 a year, and his, his requirements from the tax, the hotel tax in this area, he gets 50 grand. And I don't think 50 grand is the average wage here, but it comes out of the hotel tax. He's only obligated to work 20 hours a week. And his boss gets 25 grand, and he doesn't have any obligation on hours. And you're talking about this job with the windows. Well, I happen to do windows. I'm a glazer. I'm a trained glazer. I pr I've, I've done a lot of work in the glazing industry. So I stopped the commissioner outside and said, what about that glazing job? 
How did that, do you have any glazing contractors that bid on it? No, the general contractor did that. I said, so did they have a subcontractor that was a glazing contractor, or who did they use? How did they do? I said, were they metal windows? Because the classification, as you were speaking, excuse me, I don't mean to point, but as you were speaking of early, earlier, Representative, states what a glazer is and what a glazer's pay is on that project. Well, they didn't use the right craft, and, and I don't know what they paid, but there is no glazing contractor in Sniding County. So they went to a general contractor. Did they misclassify the worker? Did we actually see any of the bids? Did you ever see any of the documentation from any of the bids on any of these jobs that these people are coming in and throwing in front of you? I saved 50% on my, on my insurance. I, I use GEICO. You know, I could tell you that every week. But whether or not I do save that, it's just another advertisement. And we already went over the fact that all those people are, are lobbying, and, and every one of them that were here today were paid by the taxpayers to come in here. You know, they were paid to come in here today on the taxpayer's dollar, when they should have been out working somewhere else, doing something else in the community, I suppose. But maybe they feel that this is more important to cut their local workers' wages, which I'm assuming that's why they were here. And, and I'm just so up to here with all of it, all of the rhetoric. Vote the bills. Vote the bills. We've said that for three years because we believe that the legislature has the right idea. They want the taxpayers to make money. They want the taxpayers to have a good income. They want them to get their taxes back and a paycheck. What's wrong with that? I give up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Seriani. And I, I want to just note for the record that I agree with uh, Mr. Seriani that we ought to vote these bills. Yeah. It's time. Let's stop the hearings, the per diems, and all the running around all over the state, the hotel rooms, whatever the hell it's costing everybody here, and let's get the bills voted on. Because I'm thinking of running for the House of Representatives, and if I do it, you're all in trouble. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Abe Amaros. I'm the Legislative Director for the Labor's International Union, 30,000 members strong throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We consider ourselves to be a business-friendly union with 23 locals throughout the Commonwealth. Now, I will paraphrase my testimony because you've heard it three times, but I do want to stress several things. First of all, I want to preface my comments by saying that I was rather disturbed that not a single elected official asked for the passage of Senate Bill 1, which would address 5,543 structurally deficient bridges in Pennsylvania, 10,000 miles of road that need to be addressed immediately. Now, I understand that that bill is going to come up for a vote next week as well. These are matters that are important to all Pennsylvanians. I want to touch a little bit upon the human factor. A lot has been said today about workers. A lot has been said about their wages. And I want you to consider, I want you to consider that sledgehammer operator who's working 10 hours a day, 10 months out of the year, has more jarring than an NFL linebacker. And I want you to think about his wages. Does he deserve a fair wage, a livable wage, one that is family sustaining, good paying? Absolutely. Because you have a qualified person, a skilled craftsman who's had a lot of training and a lot of experience in his craft and is providing the very best in terms of the tax dollars. Municipal officials understand that as well. Without the prevailing wage, these contractors are no, under no obligation, whether it's legal or moral, to pay their workers a determined wage or a benefit. And I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, I don't know of any contractor who is going to pass along any tax savings. Just like Frank said about the GEICO commercials, they're good advertisements, they're great sound bites, but I don't see any empirical data. I see no evidence of it. And I am so glad that Representative Snyder talked about what really is driving up the costs in some of these instances. I had the opportunity to sit down with a planning commissioner in Washington County who was complaining about the fact that before a small bridge, we're talking about a 50 foot long bridge, 90 feet wide, would have the necessary approvals and permissions to go forward, you're looking at a stack of paper three inches thick worth over $100,000 just to start. 
Why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we talking about the cost of materials as well? Why are we doing this on the backs of our workers who make their living with their hands and their backs? When it rains, they don't work. When they don't work, they don't get paid. And they're only out there nine or 10 months out of the year. And then they have to supplant their wages by going to the local Wawa to make ends meet for their families. What an insult. What an insult. And this being the fourth and final hearing, I also want to talk about the training. Frank talked about it as well. These are some of the best trained individuals that we have working on our public works projects in Pennsylvania. They allow them to become under budget, on time, and done correctly the first time without add-ons, without additional revenue, with additional tax dollars going to fix things. So what do we want? Do we want employees that are making 10 bucks an hour without any health care benefits out there? Or do we want qualified, skilled craftsmen with tons of experience who can do the job correctly the first time? Now, I'd like to call your attention in my testimony to pages 7 Forgive me, page is four, because I do want to say one more thing about training. One more thing about training. Cutting the prevailing wage is a bad thing. A study done in Utah found that 40% of training funds were slashed, which led to a 15% increase in injuries. We don't want that either. That's going to eventually cost us in the long run in terms of emergency rooms, in terms of our health care system. Why do we want to burden that? With all this talk about Obamacare, and being against it, why would we want to burden our health care system? It makes absolutely no sense. Frank said this, one of the greatest values to taxpayers is training through joint apprenticeship programs with little or no cost to the taxpayer. The apprenticeship programs are under the joint administration of the local craft union and the signatory contractor group the members actually work for. And these are intensive training programs. These are five or six years long. Then they get certified and then they're qualified to work on these big projects and make the, 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 the big bucks, so to speak. And again, I want to get back to that point. They're not working 12 months out of the year. The construction season is limited. It's limited. In Pennsylvania alone, we have 121 building trades, local unions with apprenticeship programs that train nearly 8,000 registered apprentices. That's 8,000 more people, at least annually, entering the middle class in Pennsylvania. We have an obligation to ensure that these decent, hardworking people are paid what they're worth. And they're paid what they're worth based upon the surveys that are submitted to the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. And if the contractors, if the contractors are complaining that they don't have the necessary manpower, I mean, I, I don't know where to go with that argument. If I'm going into a bank and asking for a loan, and they give me a stack of paperwork this thick, I better fill out that paperwork. I can't say to that bank manager, I don't have the time to do this. Oh, this is too difficult. I don't understand the logic there, folks. I don't. I don't understand the logic. And if more contractors were to submit the information to the Department of Labor and Industry, we may see some relief, but no one's doing that. No one is doing that. So I will end my comments by saying this. I, too, hope that there is a vote on these bills. Let's put them up. Let's go yes or no on these bills so then the people of Pennsylvania can see where you stand. And again, I want to thank you. I know this has been rigorous for all of you as members of this committee. Uh, I know that you're doing some difficult work. And I empathize with the elected officials and the appointed officials as a former elected and appointed official myself in a third class city. I know these issues are not easy. But at the same time, I have to look out for workers because they're the ones that make these projects happen correctly, done on time, under budget the first time, which is a benefit to all taxpayers. So thank you to the committee. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I want to start off because I've seen you guys at three of these four hearings. You've been traveling all over the state. I want to thank you and commend you for your commitment. Um, you've, you've done a lot of traveling, and uh, your, your members that you represent should be pleased that uh, you've gone to such great lengths. I have, have two quick questions for you. Um, one, we keep going back to this subject about the reporting of data. 
And I agree there's a problem that the data is not being reported, but isn't that also an admission that essentially we're paying higher rates than we should be? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily, sir. It's an unknown. Right. It's an unknown. We, like I said, we negotiate those in the free market. We compete against Christy Bristol's company up here and, and other areas on the same projects. Um, you know, it's, it's she, her company, she stated she's not bidding projects. Remember we were talking about small companies? Not she said her plate's too full. So there was a lot of jobs out there. So, I, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. You know, either you're not bidding the projects because your plate's full or because there's too much paperwork. Make up your mind. I mean, you know, uh, also, you know, every, every county that we have contracts in, we negotiate that with private companies in the private, private sector. So those rates will only be held in that. We can't go into uh, Lycoming County and ask for uh, $80 an hour, same as Philadelphia. That doesn't work. Or, and, and it's not $80 an hour in Philadelphia, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say that. But, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's a higher cost of living there. The market will reflect that. Those contracts are negotiated in that area. The, the contracts in Warren County are negotiated in Warren. You know, we have people that work in these counties and all your power plants. Uh, you know, you see the smokestacks as you drive around and you get up to, uh, where's it, Berwick, the new plants. Well, we built that. We, we do the outages. We supply all your electricity. We tear those things apart, put them back together so you can be comfortable. And those are rates that maintain. We have hundreds of thousands of hours in those jobs. Those are prevailing rates. You can't take a company that works two jobs in an area and say, well, that was the prevailing, that should be averaged in because it's a guy with a station wagon who's never done a job. Uh, he might have done, you know, two houses, but you want to average him in on a, on a commercial building or a score or, a, or a, a, a building that has to last 50 years. A housing project is no way, a house and a home project is no way similar to a public project. Now, there may be some little niceties here and there where they overlap. But there's definitions for that. We hear, you know, Davis-Bacon this. Well, okay, Davis-Bacon threshold's $2,000. But you want to go the other way on that. But you want to go the other way on the wages, if the wages are different. Or the average wage is this. And, and you know, you're, you're mixing apples and oranges, and it's easy to do. I mean, I, I do it with my kids all the time when I don't want them to do something. It's very easy to just, you know, give them one uh, item here as an example and then par parlay it over here to another example. But Are you saying you'd be good if we went to the Davis-Bacon threshold and the Davis-Bacon wages? No, I didn't say that. We have a process in the state of Pennsylvania that supersedes that on our state-funded projects. I'm in favor of that project I want, or, or process. I want to keep that process. Okay. Okay. But you're, 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 you're mixing them up, not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I've only been here for three years, so I'm not mixing them up. But um, my, my next question is, and, and can you... I appreciate your openness in these discussions. We've had side discussions where, uh, with several of the legislators, and I, and I don't want to sound too negative up here because I don't cover this area as a, a business agent for the glazing industry, which Williamsport Glass up here is a union company, just so everyone knows. And, you know, they, they do a lot of work. They used to be the biggest house in the area. So, you know, there are, there are local union shops up here. So I don't want to, you know, ha I hear all these people saying, well, there's no union in my area. There's no union shops and there's no union businesses. You know, we have over, uh, just from the one council, we have over 75 glazing contractors. So, and they're spread out all over the half the state. So uh, I, I don't want to come across as too boisterous or un not being respectful to the committee because I'm just a little tired. I'm tired of the same thing as I told Representative Keller, it's like Groundhog Day. It's the same thing over and over again. And what is the purpose of that? Is it a purpose for actually trying to get to the bottom of it? We got to the bottom of it the first, the first meeting. The first meeting we got to the bottom of it, it, it has turned into a road show where we can take it and use it for our advantages. Let's say I'm using it for my advantage to my members that live here. Well, I didn't schedule the meeting, but we could say that it is an advantage to me because they see what I do at my job now. And I have to get elected just like you do, all of you. You know, so, you know, are we working together on this so we can all get reelected or are we, you know, what are we doing here? Well, 50% of our job is to spend time with our constituents and 
groups like yourselves when we spend 50% of our time in Harrisburg. If we don't spend enough time in the field the holding are events the like this. The vote that you made. You already voted on these things, so what's the yeah. purpose? You just voted yeah. yesterday on it, and here we are again today. You already made your statement. We're still gathering information on this topic. So you can take your vote away? There may be other bills. Yeah. Well, they're all going to say the same thing. Cut wages, cut wages, get rid of prevailing wage. A reform is a repeal in some fashion. You can say reform all you want, but reform is repeal because you're going to eliminate projects from the Prevailing Wage Act. The bill you did yesterday was a repeal. For anybody who wanted to opt out, that, all the people that you know, uh, work on those projects, they're at the mercy of low-ball construction contractors or whoever's the cheapest. You already have a Responsible Contractor Act in this state. You already have the lowest bid process. You want the best product for the best price. You know, and, and, and there's a way to do that. And there's to create standards and it's a responsibility that every local government has. I know that these local governments haven't been keeping up with the responsibility just on the maintenance issue with the highways because they abrogated that uh, when, with the memorandum from uh, the Department of Labor. But their responsibility was to, to follow the law. They, and I'll say this again, they took an oath of office, those county commissioners, those township supervisors, and they didn't uphold the law as it was written. Now, I don't know what the county commissioners did up here, whether they did milling projects without using, utilizing that law, even though it was still on the books, but they heard a rumor from the Department of La uh, Transportation and said, well, look, yeah, that's maintenance. It's a $400 million project of paving all the way up the mountain that is being going on right now that I passed. And by the way, that was a long stretch of highway. They want to call that maintenance. And you know what? There was only eight people working there. Where's the cost in that? Eight people working two weeks? It's not a billion dollars a year. It's such a minute portion of this funding process and the expense of this state and this municipalities. You know, it's just getting ridiculous. So I'm the bad guy today, no, you know, and I'm going to be the bad guy from now on. I'm, you know, I've, we tell you guys things and you don't listen to us. You go out and write a report, you, you do an editorial the day after we leave, and you, you take the opposite side of us. So what's the point of the hearings? I got guys writing editorials that, you know, aren't even involved in this. But they want to jump on the bandwagon and say, I'm saving taxpayers dollars. Oh, by the way, taxpayer, I'm cutting your wages too, but I forgot to tell you that. Or I want to look at a cheaper wage for you. Or I want, you know, I can remember the family values issue that the Republican Party stood for, family values. But that's when we developed latchkey kids. Because parents' wages dropped. They didn't keep up to the standards. And parents had to work two jobs. And then kids had to go to daycare centers. And then we couldn't wait to get him into school so we didn't have to hire a babysitter. Think about what you're doing. Representative Keller. Thank you. I didn't know that this time would ever come. Sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. And I really didn't want to answer but, the questions when we started this whole thing. Well, deja vu all over again, I guess. Uh, a couple of things, and I get, I, I'm going to start off talking about the testimony and, and a few things here that I just feel that we need to correct because I know it's been said that people are just throwing things out. The school funding issue, we can discuss that at another time, but there was stimulus dollars from the federal government that went away. Okay, that's a fact. Plan cons so, cut uh, by it's the, my turn, Mr. Sirian. I'm sorry. Marcellus Shale, we don't charge a severance tax, but we have income tax. Texas charges a 7.5% severance tax. They don't have income tax. If you compared 2010, where Pennsylvania pr produced 4% of the gas that Texas did, and you go to Department of Revenue, and you look what we collected and what Texas collected, and you divide ours by 0.04 to normalize it, we would, collect, we would have collected in excess of five times what Texas collected. So other states, we're, we're not at the bottom, we're not at the top, we're somewhere in the middle. So I just want to collect, correct those couple things for the audience. Okay, this is my this is my term. I haven't asked, I haven't asked a question yet. I do have a question, but I think it's important for people to understand that we can get you know people can come here and say whatever they want. The other people are getting accused of it. I'm not saying whatever I want because well, a lot of those wells are capped right now, and there's nothing coming out of them. The pipelines aren't finished. Mr. Sirianni, it's still my dime. That's true. My, uh, my 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 uh, constituents are paying for this microphone, and I'm going to use it. 
members. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. And I, but anyhow, and I have all the all, all the respect for all the workers in the Commonwealth, as I've said before, that whether they are members of, of a trade organization or not, they work very hard and they produce quality work. Uh, the prevailing wage, uh, it's the prevailing wage act. Nowhere in these bills does it say what we pay, that, that we have to lower anybody's pay. It simply says this is the prevailing wage act. You can use these, but you can pay the people whatever they would like. So I, a couple of questions. You threw out some numbers on a plumber, $199 for the first hour and $99 for every hour thereafter. Did you ask them how much they're paying their, their plumber, or was that their whole burden wage? I can tell you they're not paying them $99 an hour. No, but did you ask them? No. I so you had no concern for what they were paying that guy to come in and do the work in your house? Yes, I, I didn't hire them. I, was, I, was, uh, I just took it out of the phone book to find out what the cost was. You know? mm -hmm. So if you're paying $99 an hour here in the state, and for your plumbers, and they're only getting 22, someone's making a lot of money on that. Well, they're on a prevailing wage, too, if they're not. Well, let me just keep going. I'll, I'll go on with the other thoughts I had. Talk about wage surveys. There was one done by Department of Labor in 97, somewhere around that time. Yeah, Governor Ridge. Two of them were done. Yeah, we did those. Uh, what did we find in those? Well, the first one was found unconstitutional. And why was that? Because it was flawed. And why was it flawed? Why was it deemed because, to be <laughs> Because the, when they, the basis was used is they didn't use all the data that was submitted. What data didn't they use? They didn't use any data uh, from projects that were also funded by the state. Okay, so they which, used private wages. They used a portion of pri private wages. And, a, and uh, you know, this, you're talking since 1996. I can get you the information and the co copy of the court case but decision on that. But I will tell you this. It was found unconstitutional the way they did it. It didn't comply with the law. So there was another survey done in compliance with the law after that. And at that point, none of the contractors, and they, sub they went through the workers' comp contributions and the unemployment contributions, everybody who was signified as a contractor who paid into those was notified of the survey, okay? And they were asked to participate, and they did not. Well, th th then, I, then I think it's time that, but I think we can all agree that the numbers would probably turn out differently had we, if we would do it again. Everyone, uh, up the, well, some of the people there would, but I wouldn't. Okay. Um, I, I guess another thing is we, we talked a little bit about uh, fringe, fringe benefits or earlier, uh, um, Christy Bristol, I guess is her name. Or, uh, she, yeah, Crystal Bristol. Uh, she had talked about other, what are the other things that you can use the wages, uh, the, the fringes for? She went through medical pensions. like list other on any of our, our collective bargaining agreements, why that category is there. I am not sure. I do not make, I did not make that form up. I, that's been in existence for a long time. Uh, there's been some changes in how the wages and benefits could, uh, be uh, expended. As she testified, at one point they gave everything in the wages and you weren't allowed to divide any of those things if you did not have a bona fide a health plan or a pension plan and those things changed through the years. There's been, uh, there's been test case uh, with the Department of Labor and challenged by uh, some of the non-union contractors through the years and some of the contractors unions, union contractors through the years, excuse me, and uh, how those categories could be adjusted or reflect upon each other. Other, you would have to ask the Department of Labor what they allow for other. Okay, what do you, if, if I worked for you and I was a member of your organization, what would they be used for? We don't use other. Okay, what, what, what could you use the fringe benefits pay for, I guess is my question. Uh, Health care, pension, and uh, there is a stipend for apprenticeship so in other words, trainings, that kind of thing. Yes. yes. Can, can and the state finds that's necessary. And, and, you know, that does fund a lot of, like, the ABC programs. They take that money and they'll use that, whereas we, we do it out of our contractors and labor management cooperation groups. Yeah, now, I, some I, of that would go to uh, a, a union fund if, in fact, uh, the union contractor was working on there. They would be required to send that amount in. But our amounts, a lot of times, are it depends on what... what local or what area you're in are, could be significantly higher. Yeah, I, I've, never, I've never worked in a union atmosphere, so I'm asking, I, I don't know sure. what these get used sure. for. Uh, I don't sure. know about, my wife is a union member, 
Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at things. And I, I'm not saying unions if I, are. If I may, well, you had a business before. May I ask what it was? Uh, actually, actually, I worked in wood products manufacturing. I ran Triangle? a. Uh, no, uh, Conestoga Wood Specialties. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, and, and we we actually had our in our fringe benefits. We did training and so forth like that. So we and like we I did said, there are other pro programs. We, we we don't have all the programs. Now, now I understand <laughs> some union dues are are a fixed amount, and others are a percentage of pay. Is that correct? Depending on your collective bargaining agreement. Uh, I'm yeah. I haven't negotiated any contracts for a long time. Uh, every every union has the right to. Uh, vote on how their dues structure is. Uh, it has. To, there's a whole list of federal laws that we have to comply with, and if you uh, want to take dues as a way to support your membership, uh, those dues uh, it has to be voted on at a meeting by the membership to approve it. They had needs 15 days prior notice with a whole list of a whole list of things that we have to go through. So so so. Oh, I guess it's on there now. So if I belonged and worked for one of your guys' as unions, how would my dues, would it be a factor of my salary? Would it be a fixed cost? Or, I mean, I guess I'm just sort of wondering. It, it, it's individual locals have different. Oh, individual you know, locals. So some of yours would have a fixed cost and some of them may have a percentage. They may. They may. They may have either. So the ones that have But a, that's not other in the No, it's not. L&I. No, it's, it's not other because I'm, I'm going to, an, I'm, I'm heading down another path now. Oh, okay. If, 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 if I'm a union and I'm collecting as a percentage of pay, then I certainly would want to see prevailing wage stay in. I would have a vested interest we in get making the same sure. amount whether it's prevailing wage or not. No, no, no. A percentage of my pay. If I'm making fifteen dollars an hour, you're going to get. If my union dues are three percent, you're going to get three percent of fifteen. If I'm making thirty dollars an hour, you're going to get three percent of thirty, which is more money. I don't know if they have caps on them. That you know, whatever so it is. But I'm also aware that you know that's how. All businesses work, such as if you charge for a product and you're getting 10% on every dollar that you earn, if you get $2, you're getting 10% on $2 rather than a dollar in business. Is that correct? So then, yes, yeah, so or then the, these, the, then the, well, no, because then, then by paying a higher, higher wage to the workers, we're actually putting more money, taxpayer dollars, into the pocket of the business owner then, because if they would have made $10 an hour, you're, was, I think an example you used in State College, if they made $10 an hour and your markup was 2%, It'd be two percent on ten dollars. Well, if they're making thirty dollars, it's two percent on that, and and the taxpayer got no more value for that dollar. My my remarks in State College were, uh, and it had to do with the the top tier person, like a construction manager, who made five percent on every person, every craft that was out there, and a construction manager really Mr. Sirianni, don't. could you hold for just a moment? Sure. Give me a okay. Sure. We, we just have to. <laughs> We're running out We're of paper. We're getting that long-winded or what? <laughs> <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I admit it. It's me. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet it is. I bet it. All capitals. I hope. <laughs> we do take these hearings seriously and record everything. So. So if you wouldn't mind repeating the question. Go ahead. I think we were talking a little bit. We were talking about, and actually I don't have the, I had actually gone back through the transcript of that, and I think Representative Truitt, Truitt asked the question, and we were talking about an employee that made $10 an hour and then makes $20 an hour. And, of course, if, you, if, you're, if your employer puts their markup as 3% of the job, and I don't know what that 3% was the actual thing, they'd mark 3% on, on, on 20 as more than 3% on 10. And, and my comments in State College were that the, the state uh, and the public bodies, and many of these public bodies received economic stimulus money, too, to pave the roads and all that. That was shovel-ready projects. And, you know, I look around and I go through a lot of these little villages and towns and cities and I see the beautiful new brick sidewalks, you know, in, in the parking spaces that were deleted because they want to have flowers and curbs. And, you know, we want to have nice communities, you know. But, you know, when it gets down to the brass tacks of it, if you spent your money on that, you don't have your money to, to repave a road. So, you know, where you put your money if you build a brand new municipal building, and, and it's okay to build buildings. We like that, you know. But if you spend all your funding that year on that and you don't have the money left over and you're going to juggle it, and then all of a sudden the money stops coming down from the, the state government and the federal government and all those things, that's when everybody starts getting upset, and that's when people don't want to have to pay, you know, our wages or anybody's wages. But the markup in the best time that our, our Commonwealth over the past two or three years, and this is what I said, is, would have been to do as many projects as they could have at that time. 
because you had a surplus of businesses and a surplus of manpower available. So you're going to get, you know, we had companies across, and I'm not talking just about union companies because we talk to other associations, and I go to other association meetings. There were companies that were working for zero percent uh, profit margin then because they were just trying to keep their door, doors open. And, and uh, you know, that was the benefit. That was the time that Pennsylvania and our budget should have been reinvested in the in infrastructure then, not waiting until it gets busy again and prices go up and gas prices go up and all the... But, but, you know. to, but to invest in that, we would have ultimately have to go to the taxpayers and say, we need money to do it. Well, ultimately, you know, but that's who pays the bills. There's bonding. You can bond projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we bonded... Uh, we bonded $4.5 billion bond for unemployment compensation bailout for all the businesses, uh, banks, insurance companies, and everybody in the state of Pennsylvania, and, and everybody voted for that. No, that, that actually impacted, and that's all the subject here, but that actually impacted also what gets taken off of an employee's check. Well, no, Absolutely it too. was the food tax, well, so. and that was the employer tax. Right. But okay. if we didn't do certain things, it would have impacted they employees, They wouldn't have got their too. tax break, so you gave them a tax break. It would have, it would have impa impacted employees, too. I, I don't want to... You know, I know we'd that. be mixing up issues, yeah, we're, but, we're getting but we can all. bond highways, but, too. You know, I mean, there's so. nothing wrong with that. But anyhow, I, I, I will, I, I'll, I'll be about done here. I mean, I, I apologize, and I appreciate the indulgence of the testifiers and of the committee. Um, I guess the point I was trying to make, if, if union dues are a fixed percentage, or a percentage, if they're, if they're a percentage of what the uh, salary is, it does benefit certain parties to make sure, because we got accused of wanting to take money away. Well, if I'm, if I'm the head of a union, and my, dues, and my dues are a factor of Our dues are voluntarily of voted on by our memberships. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I guess I'm, go I'm going to do another thing, because you brought into the, the salaries of the commissioners and everything, and maybe mm -hmm. I'll put you guys on the spot. What do you make a year? I make $126,000 a year. And if we divide that by 2080? I, I work more than 2080. Well, I'm sure those commissioners do, too, and I guess that's my point. I don't to know do that, that. That, was, that, that probably wasn't fair if you don't know that to make that assumption. No, I, I, guess said I, I, just wanted I said I hope they're working 2080. So, so, you know. so uh, I, I guess and, my, I and again, my salary is set by my members. Mm -hmm. they, they vote on that through uh, notification. Um, and I'm, I'm probably on the low end of any of the lobbyists in this Harrisburg mm -hmm. area. Like if you would look at the county commissioner's lobbyist and their director, and I'm really a director, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm just, I just look well, like one. I, I, so, you, you, you stay, <laughs> so I'm a director you just play and one president of a council. And hey, Mr. Sirianni, you just play one on TV right now, right? My, yeah, and I'm gonna have, if you guys keep this up, I'm going to have to join the Actors Guild. So, <laughs> But um, I want to say that my counterpart in the township supervisors makes $230,000 a year plus bonuses off the taxpayers. Mine's not off the taxpayers. Mine's voluntary contributions from my members. If they, if they belong to that and they're getting money through prevailing wage, some of that act ultimately is your pay comes through the prevailing wage jobs. I would make that argument. It would be so small. Well, I, just, I guess I would just say that. It so not a, to say it, none. It would, it would be, I, you know what, I could go have a Big Mac with or a Burger King Whopper with um, I, I'm not getting into that. I guess I just want to say I don't, <laughs> want to be throw, I don't want to be criticizing the other elected officials that are here. I'm sure they earn their pay, and I guess that's my point. Right. I was just doing a comparison on wages. So, thank, thank you. Th thank you, Representative Keller. Uh, for the information of the members, I'm going to go out of our customary order to accommodate the schedule of uh, Representative Cutler and, and take Representative Cutler next. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. And, and like Representative Bloom before me, I'm going to be leaving shortly after my questions, so please, no. it's nothing that you guys said, and I'll catch up with you at the Capitol. Good news. I'm glad to hear that you're not a lobbyist because that means I'm not a politician and we're, we're in good well, company. I am a registered then. lobbyist, I mean, I, but, but I'm also the president of the council. Understood. You know, I do a political activity uh, like, on behalf of the workers. Like uh, Representative Truett, I, I personally care for these hearings because this is my first cycle on labor, so there's a lot of new issues here. So I have some prob what is probably some background uh, information, and if you already covered this in other hearings in prior sessions, I apologize. In regards to your training uh, centers, and I had the opportunity to visit my local carpenters and millwrights and was very impressed with the programs they had. What pays for that? Is that your dues money? Is that some of your fringe benefit money, or how does that work out? It's a voluntary contribution from each hour worked by our members in conjunction with the benefit from, uh, in conjunction with the employers through a joint apprenticeship training committee which is standardized by the federal government and the state apprenticeship committee okay is is that categorized under fringe benefit or does that uh, contribution come out of their 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 base wage or their their primary wage I'm just trying to understand the mechanics here okay 
our base wage is our base wage. All benefits are. So that that's a benefit then under the under the fringe. Okay. Well, we don't call it a benefit. We call it a necessity. Understood. Understood. Um, are those fringe benefits taxed? I I'll be honest. I pulled no. up the IRS publication uh, and the list of exclusions was longer than the rule, which is typical, I think. And you know, I, I saw the exclusions for health care and our, HSAs and all these other things, but I didn't see like training centers and things like that. All exempted. of our all of our trusts are uh, non-taxable. Non-taxable. Okay, right. perfect. Thank you. Um, and, and again, this is information. I know that there's been a lot of talk about data collection, and I agree with Representative Truitt and, and Galloway in that I think that that's, that's an important piece of the puzzle. Is that the reason there's a difference between the federal Davis-Bacon laws and the PA prevailing wage laws? Is there a difference in reporting, and should we be looking to Davis-Bacon to get more complete information, or is, that, is there something entirely different, like they nationalize the rate as opposed to localize? Well, when you were doing the comparison, when one of the testifiers did a comparison on those rates, uh, some of those rates are 20-some years old. Okay, so they haven't been updated. When was the last time the prevailing wage uh, was updated? Do you guys know? Annually. We, annually. we submit okay. our rates every year. All right. Perfect. This is very helpful. Thank you. Um, you scare me when I'm helpful. <laughs> I try to be agreeable, Mr. Sirianni. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> who fills out your paperwork for compliance? I know that uh, Ms. Bristol was here earlier. She, she, she does it for her shop. Right. Do you guys have folks in like the back office, so to speak, for each of your organizations that does that? We monitor that and we do try to keep uh, accurate records, but our contractors are required, the same as the non-union contractors, to fill out the compliance sheets. Okay, so they, they're responsible for what I'll call the first fill out and then you all we have access Monitor to them, and observe it, make either sure it's through proper. them or through the state because that's public information. Do you have any idea how many of those you do per year and then how many full-time employees you have to do that work? No. I don't offhand. I can't okay. give you that. Uh, and I'm glad to follow up. I don't up. even know that you know, I could come up with a number for you. On so that. that's somebody that's basically absorbed we through have your normal for, administrative you know, overhead. Okay. Function. Right. Perfect. I'm almost done. Um, your workers, uh, Mr. Ramos, I know yes. you, you said you know, they don't – they don't work when it rains, understood. Right. Uh, I, I think that, that's common sense. Um, how, and maybe you don't have this information, is there a typical wage year? I know Mr. Sirianni broke up everybody's year, you know, 2080, that's the base, 40 hours per week. Do your members typically work on average 40 hours a week, or is it slightly more or slightly less, or does that depend on it's, seniority it and a whole bunch of other things. Well, it depends on the, the project as well. It depends on the project and the time frame, of course, and, and, and then the uh, intangible factors such as weather. I mean, you don't know whether or not you're going to get five or six days of rain that are going to push the uh, project back. So all of these variables uh, come into play, Representative. Okay. And, and then how does unemployment work into that? Let's say we get the winter time. There's no more, uh, you know, paving, you right. know, after certain dates and right. all of that. Do, do your folks collect unemployment, and I'm assuming it's based off of what they work when, like everybody else, when they were working? Well, I'd like to address that, uh, and, and it's, you know, the law was changed under Act 60, and the qualifications have become more difficult the for the quarters. Our, yeah. Okay. Much more difficult for our members. Uh, I can give you an example of one local in, uh, it's a Boilermakers local, and they do, and it's in Pittsburgh. And we're doing surveys right now to find out the impact on, on that. Okay. Uh, Boilermakers Local right now out there has 450 people unemployed that have worked throughout the years and worked this past year. And 250 of them are now not eligible for unemployment, even though they paid into the fund. And that's only one local, okay, out of 113. We haven't got all the data in. And, you know, you have someone who's paid in every paycheck every year you know and there's another thing you know we, when we're doing comparisons uh prevailing wage you say and hasn't been increased the threshold since 61 well the employer contribution and unemployment has has not been increased since um 86 you know and we pay on every dollar we even offered to pay a higher amount for every hour that we worked to make sure our workers were eligible because it really affected the seasonal workers, and, and construction workers are seasonal workers. We don't even know the impact of that yet. We'll know this winter when people have had the opportunity who only work 10 months out of the year, 
and their, their high, second highest quarter might not be 50% of what they made in one good quarter because they were fortunate enough to work on a highway project where they got to work out in the hot sun from daybreak, daylight to daybreak, having people run them over or try to run them over or miss and run them over, working out there all night long, away from their family all night long because the highway can only be done at night. You know, I mean, think about this. You know how many days were over 95 degrees this year. Go out there and work in it. And I'm, you're, you have a farm. You know. You yeah, know I've been how there hard too. I worked is. on a dairy farm. And you know what? You're really, ex you're really using up people and throwing them away at the end of construction careers because you're just beat to death. Bad knees, bad ankles, bad backs. According to our conversations, and, and, and Representative Keller and I agree, Farming is the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. Construction is the second most dangerous. The guys, give, give them a break. Read the sign on the highway. Give them a break. Pay them. And I'd be interested in that information once you're done collecting it. Uh, I, I, think I, that's, I think that's another important piece of the, we the think, puzzle. We really feel that there should be some hearings on it in the future if the statistics we are seeing now keep climbing. And, you know, and I think you need to hear from the people, not us. You need to hear from the people that have been damaged by that bill. All right, and, and then I guess the last one's more of a comment more than a question. It, it just seems to me we've heard testimony again and again regarding uh, different municipalities, authorities, whomever, that they would do more jobs if they didn't have to comply with prevailing wage. It could have some kind of realignment there, whether it's the threshold, you know, whatever it is, increasing the data to normalize it uh, or whatever. It just seems to me that it'd be better for more people to be working at more jobs and kind of find that compromise that you were talking about in regards to getting more people back to work, getting more projects done, and really getting, for me, it's an, you know, it's an efficiency argument, getting the most use out of our tax money. And I, you know, Mr. Armors, you, you referenced the transportation bill. I agree, I think it's, a, it's an issue that needs fixed, but, um, you know, I, I sure wouldn't want to be sitting in the AFL-CIO boardroom uh, when you guys were discussing this next time, knowing that the public sector unions were some of the ones who helped tank the bill uh, because of the supposed linkage between liquor, privatization, and transportation. When, when you look that's, at that... That's well, the I, fourth person <laughs> I've heard that's tanked it, and one of them was me at one point. I haven't heard that about you yet, Mr. Mm, Mike Terzai said I yeah, did it. <laughs> I, I, I've heard other uh, scenarios represented, which we won't get into. Stay away from yeah. okay. who, who's at fault. Name that, calling, that's I agree. Really not and the, that's not, okay. We don't, the we're taking that with a grain of salt. Okay. Thank you, Representative Cutler. Um, we're going to uh, get, try to get back to our normal sequence and balance things out. Representative Galloway? Or Galloway, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bring me back to the old side. Galloway. I haven't heard that in a while. Um, first of all, good afternoon. <laughs> Again. Good afternoon. Um, you're right. It's, it, we are in Williamsport, but it feels like we're in Punxsutawney. It is Groundhog Day over and over. And this does appear as though it's the last one. So I want to thank you for all your testimony over not only the last couple of months. Um, I'm tired too, to be honest with you. My wife's already called me twice and asked me where I'm at and when I'm coming home. And I keep telling her I'm, I'm at a hearing on prevailing wage. And she said to me today, you've been telling me that all summer. and. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell her at this point. So I, I, there, there, I, I do want to hear, um, I, I think it would be helpful at this point, after everything that's been talked about, um, and, and to follow up on, on Representative Cutler's line of questioning about the ease and difficulty about submitting wage data to L9. We, could you just go a little bit further? I, I want to know what the process is. You said you submit it once a year. Is that normal? Uh, do other people submit it more? Uh, is it uh, more difficult for some, easier for others? Is there something we can do to make it easier? Describe the process of submitting wage data to L and I. It's as easy as taking your letterhead, listing your job classifications, like if you have a, let's say we're a non-union uh, excavating company in the northern tier here, and you have people that run heavy machinery on heavy and highway. Well, there's a classification in the Prevailing Wage Act, which they should be aware of because if they're working on prevailing wage jobs, they can see that. 
So they can take their employees' wages and enlist them on a category and say, okay, I pay my track hoe or my paver or whatever the employee does such and such an hour and list that. Then I have four laborers that work for me and I can list their wages and I can take that and put it in an envelope and mail it to the wage and hour division in Harrisburg. How long does that take? Well, they already have the data. So they have to download it or at least have some, it could take as long as filling out an E-Verify form. About 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending, I don't know. I'm not an administrator, I used to be an estimator. So I know that some of these things, if you're doing four things or five things at a time and you're a small company, it could be a little burdensome. But if you're a small company, you're not gonna be doing big projects. You're gonna be doing middle-sized projects or maybe some county paving and some smaller things. I had the road paved behind my office last week and you know, I mean, it was three people. I'm sure the cost wasn't labor that escalated that price. You know, I mean, it was like a whole city block and there was three people, I mean. Now, a lot of it could have been subbed out to truck drivers who delivered the stuff or, or whoever they bought the materials from, like if you're buying it from Pinsy Supply, they'll come and drop it right for you. There is a small charge for that, but they're not part of your payroll, that's part of your bid. So, uh, it's, it's not that hard. I think it can be done. I think it's been asked to be done for 25 years, since the Ridge administration. No one has ever stopped anybody from submitting their, their wages. And if they're embarrassed by them, that might be one reason. I'm not sure, you know. And if it's a competitive thing, well, our, our businesses that were signatory have to compete out in that market. They're not afraid to show what they're paying. And they still are successful in the private sector. So I don't think it's that difficult. I don't think it's a cumbersome process at all, Representative, and of course, I've, I've asked the question, why don't more contractors submit their wage data to the Department of Labor and Industry? And what I've been told is, it's a competitive issue. They don't want to see whose backhoe operator is getting 15 bucks an hour so they can pluck them away for 18 bucks an hour. And what we don't talk about is undocumented labor out there. Undocumented labor is not getting a fair wage, obviously, because they're not supposed to be here working. So when you throw those things into the mix, uh, you, you see that, uh, first of all, it's not very cumbersome. But secondly, what I want to hear is a way to fix that. If it is that cumbersome, let's hear from the contractors. Let's come to some sort of uh, discussion, a dialogue, instead of just ignoring it. Because, I mean, this all boils, the, the wage rate is the wage rate because of those who participate and do things above board and, and, and provide the data. That's what this is about. One other thing is it's the prevailing wage, wage rate, and it's the prevailing wage law. It's not the average wage law. Right. It's the wage that prevails most commonly used in that area. And if you don't submit it, it's not the most commonly used. One last quick question, and we're done here. I, I'm done. I got to leave. Um, yeah. The other thing is, is uh, besides the difficulty and the burdensome nature that was described as far as submitting the data was, it all comes down to cost and savings and does it or doesn't it. Um, we've heard that, first of all, what, what, is, your, what is the typical labor cost? What, what are the, on a project, what, what would be a number would, that would be typical? as far as the cost, the labor costs? Based upon the studies that I've seen, Representative, we're looking at no more than, we're looking at between 19 and 24 percent. And some estimates have even been as low as 7 to 14 percent. But what I hear constantly is 30 percent average, which is mathematically impossible. And what I heard today was even more mind-boggling. I believe I heard a 75 percent I, again, I, look, I took math for poets in college, so I'm not the greatest mathematician out there. However, I can tell you that that is just not feasible under any circumstance under the sun. Just none. None whatsoever. Even if you cut out labor right. completely. Exactly. It doesn't. Uh, and nobody's, nobody's doing the nobody's on the Nobody's working for free. All. Nobody's going to work for free. You've got to pay the laborers. You've got to pay the workers what they are worth. 
And again, it goes back to looking at the real costs. You're looking at uh, cost of materials, and you're looking at architectural and engineering costs that are skyrocketing, and I believe we need a healthy dialogue on that as well, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you all. I uh, do have to head back to Levittown, and Abe has we'll a see you back in Harrisburg. Oh. So, we, we can do one more question. Uh, Representative Snyder. I, I so I can. Okay. okay. I'll make it, I'll make it quick. I wasn't able to go to any the other hearings, unfortunately. My schedule didn't permit. So I'm very thankful that you were here today. I'm very thankful for all the testifiers. Uh, and contrary to what uh, the township supervisor said, I don't have to get out of my ivory tower because I don't think I've ever been in one. Um, my husband was a lineman for 34 years for the local power company. And here's what I know. He didn't make his wages based on prevailing wage. But I know this. If the power company just was able to hire anybody to come in and fix the lines, there would be a lot of dead workers and a lot few people able to turn the lights on. And if we're going to link the transportation bill and the liquor, that's one thing. I have a different link that I'm concerned about. I want to see a transportation bill passed. I truly do. But I have deep concerns if prevailing wage is gone and we pass a transportation bill. Because I believe my first responsibility as an elected official is the health, safety, and welfare of the people I represent. And I am not going to feel confident that the contractors that are building our bridges are going to be building them to the quality that this Commonwealth and the people deserve. Thank you. Go ahead, Greg. Thank it's you, all Representative you. Snyder. Representative Lucas. Uh, like I told you guys before, a general contractor for 30 years. Now, I agree with you a lot of things you say. This is a scope of work and specs for one project, a 40 by 40 storage building for a school district. Okay. Three sides, block walls, metal trusses, flat roof, nothing too fancy. This right here, this part right here is the paperwork for filling out for that project, for, for the bids, for the uh, bonding, for the specifications, for all the, this is three quarters of the book. This is the scope of the work. It's a little project that, that we bid on would have taken probably three, three weeks to work on. So I agree with you. There's, there's, too much, there's too much paperwork involved. There's too much engineering you have to go through and everything else. Those costs are just, look at this book. Okay. Uh, so I, I agree with you uh, on, on a lot of on that. Uh, this was, again, uh, but way above the threshold. Either way, it, it bid out for a little over $300,000. Yeah. The, the project was never done because the school couldn't afford it. Um, we bid on this project, and again, it, it was never done. Um, but I just want to show you this, this. Look at this thing. I know. It's unbelievable. We, we agree. And my, my attorney advised me never to ask a question I don't already know the answer to, but I'm going to go out on a limb here. How many of those pages pertain to prevailing wage? Uh, prevailing wage? Five. Uh, Matt, I have, actually have it right here. Uh, let's see. One, you want to exec? One, two, three, four. Five, and that's basically six. just specifying the rates? Those are the rates, six. Six pages. Yeah, I don't you have, only don't have, have to look in there to know what you're supposed to pay. They don't have they don't okay. have the job they don't have the job okay. classifications so, in this particular one. So that's not so burdensome to a borough or township to look at those five pages and uh, actually the architects and the uh, people bidding at it look at that because they're gonna know that they're responsible to pay those rates on that right, project. That's, this, this is how, how so you, anybody you that misclassifies it. a worker or doesn't pay those rates is violating the law. Correct. Correct. And that should be a crime. In Pennsylvania, it's not. There's over 30 contractors that have been debarred that have never paid the proper wages since they were found guilty for avoiding prevailing wage. And I think it's incumbent on legislators to make sure that those people are committing white collar crimes. And you know how that works. You've probably seen it in the industry. And once we start correcting that, the taxpayer will be getting what they're paying for. Right now, they're paying for something for the worker. It's for the worker to get that wage, and they're not getting it. Somebody is sticking that in their pocket. Okay, let me, let me go on. Last, uh, last time we heard, I asked a question about the bidding process, where we start out, where you have to start paying uh, for bid bonds and bids and so on. And I got this information. Uh, zero to $9,999, a municipality could just write a check. They don't have to do anything. Right. 
Um, from $10,000 to $18,499, they have to have three quotes. They could be written. Telephonic. They could be on the phone or they could be, they could be. May I interject there for one second? This was a, a issue for 25 years that we thought we could not support. And we had meetings with all of the local government committees, the township supervisors, the county commissioners, and all that. They wanted to have the ability on these smaller projects to up to $18.5 thousand dollars to take three telephonic bids. We opposed that because we thought it was in the best interest of the taxpayer for them to be public somewhere. Okay, and we didn't care where. We said let's put them on DGS website so everybody in the state can see them and you'll have more people bidding on them, you'll have a, a, a better pool of contractors bidding on them and they wouldn't accept that. So finally, last session, we thought in good faith and we worked with Senator Scarnati, uh, Representative Keller and uh, uh, several, other, s several other legislators because the figures that were thrown around, if the local governments did not have to advertise for those bids, they could save $300 million a year across the board, including the school districts and all that. So we as good citizens said, okay, if we can save them $300 million a year, we'll, we'll release the votes on those projects. And you know what? Still isn't enough. Got to have more. Every time we turn around, we got to have more. And now we have local governments not even advertising for bids. No one knows what they're doing. They could just call up and say, hey, Bill, you know, I got a job here for 18.9. Can you do it for 18.5? Good, you got it. So, you know, that's kind of a thing we didn't really like because we wanted our contractors but we to be able to see those projects in print or on a website somewhere now it's all done no one knows who gets them no one knows who was called so I think that's problematic but we went along with that in order to help the boroughs and townships and county commissioners in their plight of money that wasn't coming in anymore from uh, higher sources and I'm not going to say who again okay then from 18,500 Above, you have to have a competitive bid. Uh, that has an bids, escalator in it, too. Seal bids, um, bid bonds, and all the rest of the maintenance bonds. And, and, uh, and at 25000 and above right now, it has to be prevailing wage. That's correct. Okay. I just want to lay out for you a, a project, okay? Now I, again, I work construction 30 years. I live in a college town. I hire a lot of college students, mm -hmm. usually the wrestlers or the football players because they are really strong <laughs> and very competitive. Uh, I pay them $15 an hour. That's twice as much money that he didn't make anywhere else for that summer job, so they're happy to work for it. It costs me about 20% for my workman's comp, unemployment my un unemployment, which none of them can collect, right. okay, uh, and other things. So for 1,000 hours, that's going to cost me $18,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, say we're doing a roof job for a municipality. We get a thousand hours into it. I'm going to be there. My partner's going to be there. We're going to hire three or four or five of these college kids. We're going to pay out eighteen thousand dollars. We're going to get the job done. Mm -hmm. All right. If that goes above prevailing wage, which it would, if I'm paying out eighteen thousand dollars in labor, now I have to hire roofers out of the union hall. Now, don't get me wrong. Roofing is a hard, hard job. Sucks. That's I'm <laughs> too fat and too old to be crawling around like I used to up on a roof, but I put down thousands of squares of shingles. Okay, if I'm going to hire the guys out of the union halls, and there's no young roofers either, by the way, yeah, or no old roofers, I'm sorry, no old roofers, because it's, it's too hard on you. Okay, I'm going to pay them $23.65 an hour, and I'm going to have to pay 20% on top of that for the things we talked about. So I'm going to come out to $28,380 for that same thousand hours. Now on top of that, I have to pay their benefits. Now, the benefits I don't have to get taxed on. I can send that into the union and they'll take care of that. That's an additional $12,170. So I'm paying these union contractors $40,550 for the same job that me and my wrestlers did for $18,000. For, for $18, so I'm saving $22,550. Now, there's no way I'm going to be charging I'm not going to charge that municipality a union scale for, for, for basically uh, college kids to do that roof. But we'll still do the job. We'll still, still do the job well. Okay? Now, if I do the same job with my same crew, with my wrestlers and football players, mm -hmm. okay, I have to pay them prevailing wage. I have to pay them the 23 
plus a $12.17 benefit for a total of $35.82. Now I have to pay 20% on top of that mm -hmm. be because I have to pay that taxes on that additional benefit money. So I'm paying a total of $42,984 for the same labor I could did for $18,000, the same exact crew. Now my guys are loving it. Who is loving even more is the bar owners in the town when I give them their paycheck on Friday right. because they're going to go, that's where they're going to blow it all at. But does, that, that doesn't make any difference. Okay, but what I'm saving, what I'm saving with the same exact crew is $24,984 for the same 1,000 hours of work with the same amount of crew that I'm doing. What you guys keep on saying is we're slashing prevailing wage, but we're not slashing prevailing wage. I'm just having someone else do the work and they're working for less money. Right. And these guys, that's, to them, $15 an hour is, is a huge amount of money for them. And we're, sure. they're still getting the same exact product. Sure. Now, I wouldn't put those guys uh, at a nuclear ex power same plant. Same exact product? Same exact product. I'll guarantee you the same exact product. Okay. okay. You are, I wouldn't put those same guys in a nuclear power plant, okay, doing work there. Okay. But for a job like this, they can do that. And I've saved that municipality. Now almost $25,000 for the same job that they can go on and do another project to. Okay. That's my argument. Okay. Crowd of one. Okay. <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hear you and I understand what you're saying. So let me tell you what's going on there, okay? Uh, you're taking college students who come in, maybe they live there, maybe they don't live there. Maybe they're from out of state. Maybe you know. I grew up at State College, and I saw some of the same things happen. Uh, and those people are going to grow up away and move away. They're not the the roofers that live there and raise their families and pay the school taxes and all those things. Maybe a few of them will be, but I think most people that go to Edinburgh are going to Edinburgh and they're leaving. And I may be wrong. I don't know. I don't know what the whole texture is up in Erie County, but you know, I I do go there. As a matter of fact, I lived in. Uh, my father built. Uh, uh, what's the golf course up there? The um, uh, Lakeview Country Club. He supervised that construction. I used to live in Northeast PA. I was born in Warren County. But I can tell you this, in State College, I could call that, you know, we had 30, 40,000 students there, and they do stimulate the economy when they're there. But when they're not, or, or when they're not in school, they're taking jobs from local residents. And I used to call that the land of little opportunity when I lived there because when I lived there, it was hard to get a good paying job because any student that came into town would work for hardly anything. Beer. They would work for beer if you asked them to. You know, they really would. You give them a cake, they'll do the same thing. You know, I mean, go down to Carlisle, Sister Blooms, go to Dickinson. Alcohol, you know, I mean, they, they drink better than anybody down there. I used to replace the windows every weekend, you know, from beer bottles going through them and the parties they used to have. So. You know, do you want to build a community or do you want cheap labor? Do you want to have citizens that are going to remain in the area? Do you want your company to have longevity or do you just want to keep churning people through as they graduate? Or do you want to have people that are going to grow up in Williamsport or Erie or wherever it is and they're going to pat you on the back and say, you know what, you've been a damn good state, state rep and I raised my family and you helped me do that. And my kids are now going to college because I can afford to pay for them to go to Edinburgh. You know, every job they take from those local union guys that you like to use, and I'm, proud, I'm really happy to hear you do use them, that's one less kid that can go to, uh, go to Edinburgh University because he doesn't get that job because you undercut the wages there. I didn't undercut the wages. No, no, you, you got I cheap did, labor. I didn't undercut the wages. That's, that's, that's the labor cost that bears what goes on in that town. Now, so you're the, saying that union laborers don't, or our union roofers don't work anywhere else? The union roofers are working in Erie on bigger projects. They aren't going to want to do a little shingle job somewhere. But if they're prevailing wage, you're just paying your people a different rate and, and maintaining the standard for the area so the bigger projects and the local guys keep their standard where it should be, well, what I'm rather saying, than having students coming in and undermining the standard. What I'm saying is that those jobs probably wouldn't get done if they had to pay prevailing wage to get it done. Thank you. Well, you're done. Thank you, Representative Lucas. We, have, we do have one more testifier who's been very patient. Thank and I want to thank you both again for coming back four times. It was really... Well, we, we're well thank willing you. to talk aside from this, so thank very you. Very good. And thanks to the staff for doing all the prep work. Really, that goes unnoticed and it should not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, uh, very patient uh, Dr. Oscar Nade uh, representing 
the Williamsport Area School District. Um, Dr. Nate, I apologize. We made a number of adjustments to the schedule today to accommodate folks that had to, to leave early, and you got the short end of that. Thank you for sticking around for us. Fortunately, I don't live too far away, so uh, <laughs> I don't have a big travel problem. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'm Oscar Nade, I'm a former uh, school superintendent here in Williamsport for 20 years, and uh, I'm now engaged as a community volunteer, primarily uh, with Preservation Williamsport. It's an organization that uh, seeks to preserve the rich har architectural heritage of uh, Williamsport and uh, educate folks about the value of preservation. I believe you all have my written testimony. Let me just refer to a couple of points because this hearing now is officially over according to Mr. Karn's schedule. I don't want to keep you over time, but I will uh, point out a few things in the testimony. I was responsible for seven building projects during 20 years as superintendent of schools. And the previous testimony, to the contrary, application of the prevailing wage cost the taxpayers of the Waysport Area School District 30% more than they needed to. Enough said. You have one bill out of committee, 796. I think there are now two bills. You just sit through three bills. I would hope that one of them is 1191. Is it? No. Well, that's the best of the bunch that you had before you, and it's the one that does the most to create the inequities that uh, Prevailing Wage Act affects us here at Williamsport. Uh, we, we think that, uh, I think, and I'm not representing the Williamsport Area School District, by the way, I, I, I have been retired from that for 21 years. But I can tell you that during those 20 years that I was superintendent, we, uh, we paid a burden. I think two things or three things can be said about the Prevailing Age Wage Act very briefly. One is it needs an increase in the threshold consistent with some recognition that inflation exists, whether it's 190,000, 500,000, whatever. But 25,000 since 1963, no, that's not realistic. Secondly, the threshold needs to be indexed, and a CPI doesn't do it. CPI has affects the increased cost to a way, urban wage order of the things they use to live and eat with. You need a construction or building cost index. And that should be built into the act. And uh, I Googled it, anybody can. And there's a host of possibilities. One of them out of the engineering uh, news record publishes both a building and a construction cost index. Let me tell you what that might have been to some high schools. I spent uh, some of my retirement years working for an architectural firm as an education facility planner. We did feasibility studies. I have some experience in watching the rising cost of school facilities. We built a high school in Williamsport, completed it in 1972, an enrollment capacity of almost 2,500 students, and uh, it's got 12 acres under roof, and it cost $16 million to build and completed it in 1972. From my experience as an educational facilities planner, I noticed that that same building today would cost 110 to $120 million. And back in its time, 1972, your colleagues at that time referred to it as a Taj Mahal and enacted limitations on how much you could spend without a public hearing. <laughs> so it goes. My other part of the testimony has to do with our uh, historic preservation. Williamsport has a nationally certified historic district, consisting mostly of Victorian era homes built during the period of time when Williamsport was regarded as the lumber capital of the world. The lumber industry and related industries made a lot of people in this city wealthy, some of them very, very wealthy. They built fabulous mansions along West 4th Street and West 3rd Street, and if you have the time sometime, drive in that historic district and look at those mansions. They're in the process of being restored. Many of them were badly degraded, however. During the 1930s, when we had the Great Depression, 
a lot of the stained glass windows were sold out. They were cut up into apartments and rooming houses. The fixtures and the ceilings were all sold off. One of those houses, the house built by Edwin and Emma Rowley, did not experience that kind of degradation. The third owner was the Diocese of Scranton. They bought it at a fire sale price from the previous owner in 1932, and it became a convent for sisters who would teach across the street at St. Joseph's School. The sisters took care of the place. It's a gem. It looks like it did when they took it over. Very little change. Original floors, original wainscoting. Uh, we've had to do some restoration work. But that building is owned now by Preservation Williamsport, a foundation that, whose mission I described to you earlier. We would like to do some work there and have done some work there. Uh, at, one, at one time, one of your former colleagues, uh, State Representative Capelli, secured, uh, helped us secure a DCED grant, $90,000, with which we were going to both paint the exterior and replace the hamasite in, in the carriageway with brick pavers. We had bid the job earlier, got some quotes, we applied prevailing wage when the uh, contractor was selected, and it cost us $90,000 to do $60,000 worth of work. It didn't include the paint, painting. It included only the driveway work. What I'd like to propose for you is uh, another amendment to an existing bill or something you might deal with independently. We'd like to do a kitchen project. We'd like to restore the kitchen to its original state, make it look authentic the way the rest of the house does. Figure of it cost about $70,000, and I have looked into getting a Keystone Historic Preservation Grant from our own Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. But there's some limitations. One is that uh, maximum award is $25,000. Two, it needs a 50-50 cash match, and three, it's a prevailing wage, uh, it's applicable to the Plant Prevailing Wage Act because it exceeds $25,000 in cost. We haven't got it done. What I'd like to suggest, that, uh, and, and we don't go around looking for that private match because donors, potential donors have told me, well, if this is a prevailing wage job, a third of my money is going to go to an artificial wage. One that just doesn't happen here. So what I'd like you to do is consider amending the A bill using language from the Keystone Grants eligibility guidelines, who may apply. I'd like you to amend a bill to exempt nonprofit organizations and public agencies that own or support a publicly accessible historic property listed or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, or that own a, and support a contributing historic property to a National Register Historic District, which is what we are. That would make it a lot easier for nonprofits to do the kinds of jobs they need to do to further their mission of historic preservation in the Commonwealth and especially in Williamsport. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, that's the end of the testimony I have to offer. If you have <laughs> the ability, I know the mind can absorb only as much as the butt can endure, and you've been here for a long time, so if you have questions, I'll be pleased to entertain them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanted to uh, give you some good news. That, you know, we do have a bill in the pipeline uh, by one of my colleagues from the district right next to mine in Chester County to um, allow um, or historic properties and land conservancies to opt out of the Prevailing Wage Act, much like we've had a, a bill to let school districts opt out of prevailing wage, or we've had bills to let municipalities. There's there's a lot of different things in the pipeline. It's one of the things that uh, the prior testifier had alluded to. He wondered why he was here testifying when we've already voted on some bills, but there's still more in the pipeline. And what you've described is one, and, and I'm sure Representative Milne is probably going to look for opportunities to amend his bill onto something else as things work at, work work their way through. Um, do you have a question, Greg? No. 
do you have any sense um, of how many other organizations like yours might be out there that would benefit from the legislation that you described? No, I don't know if with any degree of certainty, but it would even help municipalities in a sense that uh, I know in the borough of Jim Thorpe, for example, they took over an abandoned mansion. Uh, problem, I'm not exactly sure when it was completed, but as a municipality, they're a nonprofit, obviously. But if they try to enhance or improve that facility individually, they've got a prevailing age, wage act problem. M Representative Milne's bill would uh, take care of that problem, make it go away. Okay. And uh, we have historic districts. Belfont is nearby. They have a historic district. Uh, and uh, his, uh, regis homes that are on the National Register of his Historic Places. Do you happen to know if um, projects like that, if they receive any federal funding, are they subject to Davis-Bacon rules? Uh, usually their uh, federal funding does, got, does not come down for those. I've uh, talked to uh, two representatives, uh, Representative Marino most recently, who represents this congressional district here. Uh, he said, we'd love to be able to do something for you, but we don't have a, we, we can't do earmarks anymore. And then, and then finally, just in terms of the extra costs associated with prevailing wage, I'm wondering where you would rank that among the various cost concerns that school districts have. Let's say um, money that goes to cyber charter schools versus prevailing wage versus wow. who knows what else. Where, do, where does prevailing First, wage rank? Prevailing wage uh, does not rank high uh, among the ones that you just described, uh, probably because not every school district is doing uh, school construction work, for example. And with the uh, freeze on plan con projects initiated by the Corbett administration, they aren't going to be doing any in the near future. There are no plan con approvals being uh, processed. Only what was already in the pipeline and had passed a certain level of approval, those projects may proceed. So uh, prevailing light waste is going to be less and less a problem. It's going to be employment that will be a bigger problem because construction workers who look for school projects won't have any. I would say cyber, cyber education tuitions. And the amount of money that school districts have to pay for cyber schools, it's unrealistically, it's, it's, uh, it's unreliable, it's not predictable, and it's outrageously high. Okay, but so you're saying that of the different entities that could benefit from prevailing wage uh, reforms, you would see greater benefit to um, historic organizations at this point than school districts? Yeah, uh, if they were exempted, absolutely. And, or even if the threshold were increased to a, a level consistent with what inflation would have done to the $25,000 threshold established in 1963. And I think that's about $189,000 or something like that. Not 100000 like uh, is proposed at 796 But municipalities would benefit. We have a swimming pool in William, the city of Williamsport that needs repairs. It isn't going to get repaired. And it's a neighborhood that needs recreational uh, opportunities, more recreational opportunities. I don't know what the cost of that swimming pool would be to fix it, but it probably could escape prevailing wage in the city. If the James V. Brown Library, which receives uh, some funding from Lycoming County through a dedicated library tax, needed a new roof, they're stuck. They're not, uh, they're, they're not exempt. They've got to pay prevailing wage for that new roof. So, and the roofing, uh, somebody talked about roofing uh, salaries earlier in, in testifying. They're nowhere near the salaries that are paid in this locale. Hey, part of our problem, and that's why I suggested that 1191 might be the solution, get the wage rates for the county in which the work is being done. That's what the Prevailing Wage Act is intended to mean. But if a given trade doesn't have a negotiated wage rate in Lycoming County, the secretary has to go someplace to find that wage rate, and sometimes it's in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. I agree. Well, well thank you, Dr. Nader. Yeah. Again, I appreciate your, your patience. Uh, we, the, the hearing ran a little bit longer than scheduled, but it's tough. We always have to try to give every member their fair shake. Um, but thank you very much for your time and for, for coming here today. You're welcome. Uh, just, uh, I guess, 
for the record, we should note that uh, we d we've also received written testimony that was submitted from Joe Rigard, the supervisor of Gamble Township in Lycoming County, and from Kathy Swope, the regional director of the Pennsylvania School Boards Association, and the president of the Lewisburg Area School District Board of Directors. And uh, unless there are any objections, that will uh, conclude the meeting for or the hearing for today. And uh, thank you all for your interest.